Section 84 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 16. Conclusion decadence and extinction it is not our province to enter into the horrors of the savage carlist war which broke out forthwith and lasted until the convenio de vergara in eighteen thirty nine the rapid sketch which we have given of its antecedents suffices to show how christina in order to make head against the extremists was perforce obliged to consolidate a party composed of the moderate royalists and the liberals, while the progress of events threw her more and more into the arms of the latter. The solemn proclamation of Isabel's succession, October 20th, was accompanied by measures restricting the oppressive powers of the royalist volunteers, restoring the laws respecting mayorazgos and other reforms of the constitutional period. That this process once begun, should continue with accelerated momentum was inevitable and also that it should sweep aside the poor remnants of the inquisition this was so much a matter of course and in the comatose condition of the institution was of importance so slender that the memoir writers and historians of the period if they allude to it at all do so in the briefest and most perfunctory manner yet the profound roots which it had struck in the national life and the hold which it had acquired on popular veneration are manifested in the fact that the struggle for its extinction had extended over a period of more than twenty years and required for its consummation a change in the ideals of a majority of the people the time for this had at last come and the final dissolution was accomplished with only so much of a discussion as to show that the opinions of those called upon to decide were virtually unanimous in principle and only different as to the opportuneness of the measure at a meeting of the consejo de gobierno july nine eighteen thirty four there was submitted the project of a decree for the extinction of the inquisition and the disposition of its property this was considered july eleventh when the majority consisting of the archbishop of mexico the duke of balen the marquis of las amarillas and don jose maria puig approved of the decree with some unessential modifications the minority consisting of the marquis of santa cruz the duke of medina celi and don francisco xavier caro opposed the article extinguishing the inquisition on the ground that it was already extinguished matters of faith were treated in the episcopal tribunals and it was inopportune to call public attention to an affair which all the world regarded as settled while the application of the property ought to be submitted to the approaching cortes at the next meeting held july thirteenth a dictamen was adopted embodying the views of the majority and suggesting certain amendments of no special moment in principle which were virtually accepted by the regency no time was lost in making the final draft which was published july fifteenth the preamble recited the desire of the regency to strengthen the public credit in all ways compatible with justice that the late king had considered the imprescriptible episcopal jurisdiction and the laws of the land sufficient for the protection of religion that a decree of january four eighteen thirty four had committed to the bishops censorship over writings on religion morals and discipline that the labors on the criminal code now completed established appropriate penalties for assaults on religion and that the junta ecclesiastica created by decree of april twenty second was occupied with proposing what was deemed necessary to this end therefore the regent in order to provide a remedy in so far as the real patronato extended and with the concurrence of the holy see as far as this was necessary after consulting the council of government and the ministers decreed article one the tribunal of the inquisition is declared to be definitely suppressed 
Article 2. Its property is appropriated to the extinction of the public debt. Article 3. The 101 canonries annexed to the Inquisition are applied to the same object, subject to the royal decree of March 9th last, and for the time expressed in the apostolic bulls. Article 4. The employees who possess prebends or obtain salaried civil offices will have no claim on the funds of the tribunal. Article 5. The other employees will receive from the sinking fund the exact salaries corresponding to the classification which they will establish with the junta ecclesiastica. Such was the brief and decisive decree which terminated the existence of the institution created by the piety of Isabella and the fanaticism of Torquemada. There still remained the juntas de fe of the bishops, some at least of whom persisted in maintaining them, with the old inquisitorial methods, in spite of the constitution of Pius VIII and the royal decree of February 6, 1830. Their continuance was incompatible with the rapidly increasing anti-clerical spirit of the dominant party, and they were prohibited by a decree of July 1, 1835, in which, after alluding to the disregard of the papal and royal utterances, Christina ordered that they should cease immediately wherever they had been established. The ordinary episcopal courts were required to observe the law of the partidas, the canons and the common law in all cases of faith and others of which the extinguished inquisition had had cognizance conforming their procedure to that in other ecclesiastical matters and admitting the appeals allowed by law cases of solicitation were provided for by a clause providing that where scandal or offence to morals might ensue a prudent secrecy should be observed the hearings to be held with closed doors in the presence of the accused and his counsel, from whom nothing was to be withheld. Thus the last trace of inquisitorial procedure was forbidden on Spanish soil. After so many centuries of conscientious intolerance, the lesson of toleration was hard to learn. On August 14, 1836, the Motin de la Granja forced Cristina to proclaim once more the Constitution of 1812, with its prohibition of any religion save Roman Catholicism. This instrument, with all its crudities, was soon found to be unworkable, and the Constitution of 1837 marked an advance in its simple declaration that the state obligated itself to maintain the cult and ministers of the Catholic religion, which was that of Spaniards. Then came a reaction, and... When the Constitution was revised in 1845, the principle of intolerance was reaffirmed. The European disturbances of 1848 strengthened this spirit in the Church, and it found expression in the Penal Code of 1851, of which Articles 128, 129, 130, and 131 inflict imprisonment and exile for any attempt to change the religion of Spain for public worship in other faiths, for apostatizing from Catholicism, or for publishing doctrines in opposition to it. The Spanish bishops were even encouraged to call for the revival of the Inquisition under their management, but this would have been superfluous. That the law was quite sufficient for the repression of Protestant propaganda was shown in 1855 by the long imprisonment and exile of Francisco Ruet at Barcelona. It is true that in 1856, during the brief return of the liberals to power, a constitution on a more tolerant basis was framed, but a speedy reaction prevented this from going into effect, and the instrument of 1845 remained in force until the revolution of 1868. Ruet's chief disciple was Manuel Matamoros, who made numerous converts in Malaga, Granada, and Seville, but in 1860, prosecution caused him to fly to Barcelona, where he was thrown in jail and taken back to Granada. Some 20 more were arrested, among whom were his two principal aides, José Alhama and Trigo. 
Matamoros and Alhama were condemned to eight years of presidio and trigo to four, while similar sentences were pronounced in Seville on Tomás Bordalo and Diego Mesa Santaelo. The affair made a sensation throughout Europe. The Evangelical Alliance bestirred itself and a deputation representing nearly every nation assembled in Madrid to intercede for the convicts. The pressure was so great that on May 20, 1862, the sentence rendered three weeks before was commuted to nine years of exile, which enabled the Evangelicals, from the safe refuge of Gibraltar, to maintain relations with their secret converts that under this reaction the resuscitation of the Inquisition was seriously considered may be assumed from the publication in 1859 of a pamphlet containing the speech of Ostolaza in the Cortes of Cadiz in favor of the Inquisition and those of Munoz Torero and Toreno against it, with the manifesto of the Cortes thus contributing to the debate under the guise of impartiality the weight of argument against the Holy Office. When came the Revolution of 1868, the constituent Cortes, after a vigorous debate, affirmed May 8, 1869, the principle of religious liberty by the decisive vote of 163 to 40. In the new Constitution, proclaimed June 6, the free exercise, public and private, of faiths other than Catholicism was guaranteed both to foreigners and Spaniards. Under this, the Código Penal Reformado, which is still in force, provides penalties of fine and imprisonment for any interference with religious belief, whether by constraint to acts of worship or impeding those of the individual's chosen faith. Finally, in 1876, still another constitution, which has endured to the present time, after declaring Roman Catholicism to be the religion of the state, prohibits the molestation of anyone for religious opinion or for the exercise of his cult, insofar as Christian morals are respected, but it does not permit public ceremonies other than those of the state religion. This summary of the vicissitudes in the progress of toleration since the suppression of the Inquisition is not foreign to our subject, for it teaches two lessons. One is that the main assaults on the ecclesiastical system of Spain, its members and its temporalities, were committed before toleration was extended to the heretic. For the secularization of church property, the abrogation of tithes and first fruits, and the suppression of the regular orders, were chiefly affected by measures adopted between 1835 and 1855. The other is that the slender results of Protestant propagandism from the days of George Borrow to those of Pastor Fliedner show how little Catholicism has to fear from such efforts among a people who, if they abandon the faith of their fathers, are much more apt to seek refuge in negation of religion than in heresy. Together, they demonstrate that the terrors of the Inquisition were superfluous, and that the injuries which it inflicted on Spain were not compensated by any corresponding benefits, even from the standpoint of the Church. End of section 84. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 85 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mukun Manikarnike from Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 2, Conclusion Retrospect, Part 1 No modern European nation has endured such vicissitudes of good and evil fortune as the Spanish. From the virtual anarchy of the Castilian kingdoms under Juan II and Enrique IV, the resolute wills of Ferdinand and Isabella evoked order and by the union with Aragon, the conquest of Granada, Naples, and Navarre, 
and the acquisition of the new world, they left Spain in a most commanding position. When under Charles V, to this were added the Netherlands, the Austrian possessions, Milan and the headship of the Holy Roman Empire, the hegemony of Europe was secured and the prospect of attaining the universal monarchy seemed sufficiently possible to arouse the fears of Europe. The loss of the empire and of Austria, awarded to the younger branch of the Habsburgs, strengthened rather than weakened the inheritance of Philip II by rendering it less cumbrous and unwieldy, while the acquisition of Portugal unified the peninsula and the increasing wealth of the Indies promised almost unlimited resources for the extension of his power. Yet this power, so colossal in outward seeming, was already becoming a mere shell, covering emptiness and poverty, for its rulers had exhausted the nation in enterprises beyond its strength and foreign to its interests. Throughout the 17th century, its downward progress was rapid until, at the death of Carlos II in 1700, it had reached a depth of misery and helplessness in which it might almost despair of recuperation. Yet its efforts in the War of Succession showed that it still possessed a virile nationality, its decadence was arrested, and a slow upward progress was begun, accelerated under the enlightened rule of Carlos III until, at his death in 1788, it had so far regained its position that, if not yet a power of the first rank, it might not unhopefully look forward to attaining that position. Then followed the weak and disastrous reign of Carlos IV under the guidance of Godoy when impotence invited the intrusion of Napoleon, resulting in the manifestation of national energy which surprised the world in the heroic war of liberation. After the restoration in 1814, the land was for more than half a century the scene of almost unintermittent conflict between antagonistic forces resulting in apathy of exhaustion after attaining the form of democratic constitutional monarchy. Yet we are told that absolute monarchy has merely been replaced by absolute caciquismo or, in American parlance, the rule of the political boss. Government, it seems, is exploited purely for the private interest of the office-holding class, and the strength of the nation has been wasted. Its development has been neglected until the unexpected feebleness revealed in the War of 1898 led earnest patriots to declare that if the existing maladministration were to continue, it would be better to seek shelter under England or France and put an end to the history of Spain as an independent nation. This shock to the national consciousness and the skillful and vigorous agitation to which it gave birth bear promise of results in the political as well as in the material and industrial development of the land. And we may reasonably hope that a nation which has suffered so much with fortitude is entering upon a new career that may make amends for the miseries of the past. Vicissitudes such as these have their causes and we cannot conclude this long history of the Inquisition without inquiring what share it in the spirit which at once created and was stimulated by it, contributed to the misfortunes endured with few intermissions by the Spanish people since its organization. These causes are numerous, many of them not directly connected with our subject, but yet to be enumerated in order that undue importance may not be ascribed to the influence of the Inquisition. To begin with, the Spanish monarchy developed into a pure despotism based on the maxim of the institutes quod principi plaquit legis habet vigorem, the prince's pleasure has the force of law. All legislative and executive functions were concentrated in the crown. The king issued laws, levied taxes, raised troops, declared war, made peace at his will, and the execution of the Justicia Lanusa in 1591 without a trial shows that the lives of his subjects were at his disposal. It was the same with their liberties as illustrated by the imprisonment without a hearing of ministers like Caberus, Florida Blanca, Javarenos, and Arquillo. For a while, the ancient fueros of the Kingdom of the Crown of Aragon served as some restraint in those territories 
But Philip V in 1707 and 1714 took advantage of the war of succession to declare them forfeited. Under such concentration of authority, the fate of the nation depended on the character and capacity of the monarch. Charles V had unquestioned ability, but his ambitious enterprises, while flattering to the national vanity, not only exhausted the resources of Spain in quarrels foreign to its interests, but crippled its prosperity by the reckless devices employed to supply his needs. Philip II was a man of very moderate talents, irresolute and procrastinating to that degree that the Venetian envoy Van Romino in 1595 declared that what would cost another prince ten ducats cost him a hundred in consequence of his dilatoriness. His enormous and disjointed empire was too much for his narrow intelligence, and his vast expenditures in defense of Latin Christianity consumed all his resources and kept him in perpetual financial straits. At his death in 1598, he had nothing to show for the ruin of his country but the gloomy pile of the escorial and acquisition of Portugal. Holland was hopelessly lost. His rival, Henry IV, was firmly seated on the throne of a reunited France, and the papacy was alienated. The internal condition of the land is depicted in the despairing complaints of the Cortes of 1594. The truth, which cannot be questioned, is that the kingdom is totally exhausted. Scarce any man has money or credit, and those who have it do not employ it in trade or for profit, but hold it to live as sparingly as possible, in the hope that it may last them to the end. Thus comes to the universal poverty of all classes. There is not a city or a town, but has lost largely in population, as is seen by the multitude of closed and empty houses, and the fall in the rents of the few that are inhabited. With Philip III, we commence the long line of favorites who dominated Spain during the 17th century. Well-meaning, but weak and incapable, he left everything to the Duke of Lerma, under whose guidance a reckless course of prodigality was followed as though the only trouble was to get rid of the surplus revenues. Charles V had cast aside the severe simplicity of the old Castilian court for the stately magnificence of the Burgundian household. His successors followed his example in spite of the remonstrances of the Cortes, but where Philip II spent on it 400,000 ducats a year, Philip III lavished a million and 300,000 while he was begging money of his nobles and prelates and seeking to seize all the plate in the kingdom in order to coin it he was not alone in this for the nobility and gentry were consumed with ushery and overwhelmed with debt owing to their extravagance the venetian envoy contarini in 1605 describes the land as overspread with poverty and general discontent and all the evils attendant upon a corrupt and a vicious government under an indolent king and a rapacious and incapable minister. The worst war, he concludes, that could be made on Spain was to allow it to consume itself in peace under misgovernment, while to attack it would be to arouse the dogged determination of the people. The reports of the Luchess envoys tells the same story. Such was the condition when the expulsion of the Moriscos robbed the land of its most productive class. Matters grew worse when Philip IV ascended the throne in 1621. Good-natured, affable, indolent, and pleasure-loving, his 31 unacknowledged natural children, besides the acknowledged one, the second Don John of Austria, served to explain why he abandoned the cares of state to his favorite, the Count Duke Colivers, after whose fall in 1643 his nephew Don Louis de Haro succeeded to the post. The official historiographer describes Spain at his accession as being in extremity and the people crushed under their burdens. Everything was in disorder and the condition of the nation so weakened that it could only be deplored and not amended. Yet Philip's first act was to break the truce with Holland and from that time to the end of his long reign he was involved in almost continual war. He called together the Cortes and asked for supplies to which they replied by petitioning him to try to stop the general depopulation and 
find occupation for the people who were wandering with their families over the country in vain search for work. Yet Philip, engrossed with his plebeian amours and pleasures of his court, continued his wars and his extravagance, without giving a thought to the misery of his people whom he was crushing with ever new exactions. The courtly festivities were conducted with a magnificence till then unexampled. The Carnival Festival of 1637 was officially admitted to cost 300,000 ducats and was popularly estimated at half a million. In 1658, the Venetian envoy reports his giving to the son of Don Luis de Haro 50,000 pesos for skillfully arranging a ballet for the ladies of the court. Every bullfight cost him 60,000 reales and the celebration at the birth of Prince Prosper, who speedily died, involved an expenditure of 800,000 pesos. All this, as the envoy remarks, was extracted from the blood of the miserable people who were poorer in Spain than anywhere else. The immense resources of the kingdom were absorbed by the rapacity of the ministers or were dissipated by the profuseness of the king. In 1665, Carlos II, then but four years of age, succeeded to his father under the regency of the queen dowager Maria Anna of Austria. We have seen how she abandoned affairs to her confessor, the Jesuit Nitha, and when he was dismissed by the efforts of Don John of Austria in 1669, she replaced him with the worthless favorite, Fernando de Valenzuela. Again, Don John was called in. Valenzuela was exiled to the Philippines, and Don John assumed the reins of the government. His limited abilities were unequal to the task, he was driven from power and died soon afterwards in 1679. Carlos had been declared of age in 1675. He was utterly incapable, and though he can scarce be said to have had favorites under such ministers as the Duke of Medinacelli and the Count of Oropesa, Spain sank deeper in misery and degradation until his death in 1700. The kingdom was reduced to the last extremity without money, without industry, without means of defense to resist the aggressive wars of Louis Fourteenth, or to defend the colonies from the ravages of buccaneers. The population is said to have shrunk to 5 million. In 1586, it had been estimated at 8 million by the Venetian envoy Gradenigo. Such was the result of two centuries of absolute government under monarchs, not willfully evil, who merely reigned according to the light vouchsafed them. Yet it was not so much the extravagance of the court or the perpetual wars of the Habsburgs or the emigration to the colonies that reduced the population and the power of Spain. The land could have endured all these if its rich resources and vast opportunities had been wisely developed. Lying between two seas and holding Sicily and Naples, it commanded the Atlantic and the Mediterranean with its wealthy colonies, the source of the precious metals which revolutionized the finances of Europe and furnished the basis for the most profitable commerce that the world had seen. It was invited to become the greatest of maritime states with a navy and a mercantile marine beyond rivalry dominating the seas as the Catalans had dominated the Mediterranean in the 13th and the 14th centuries. It was largely secured from hostile aggression by the Pyrenees and could work out its destinies with little to fear from external enemies. It is true that much of its surface is mountainous and that large districts suffer from insufficient precipitation, but the Moors had shown what wonders could be wrought by irrigation and how by patient labor even mountain sites could be made to yield their increase. No land could boast a greater variety of agricultural products, including those of semi-tropical and temperate zones, which, combined with mineral wealth, should have rendered itself supporting. All that was needed was a steady and intelligent industry fostered by wise legislation encouraging production and commerce, and enabling every man to work out his own career with as few artificial impediments as possible, and Spain might be today what she was in the 16th century, the leader among civilized nations. That was not to be. The fatal gift of the Burgundian inheritance distracted the attention of her rulers from the true arena of her expansion in Africa, 
and on the ocean to distant enterprises wholly foreign to her true interests, while the undeviating determination to enforce unity of faith at home and to combat heresy elsewhere led her to drive out her most useful population and involved her in ruinous expenditures abroad. To extort the means for the furtherance of this policy, industry was strangled with the most burdensome and complicated system of taxation that human folly could devise, the weight of which fell almost exclusively on the oppressed producing classes, who were least able to endure it, while the nobles and gentry and clergy, who held by far the larger portion of the Spanish wealth, were exempt. As taxation was virtually at the discretion of the monarch, imposts were added as the exigencies of extravagance demanded, usually with little thought as to their consequences, until the taxpayer was entangled in a network which crippled him at every step. This, moreover, was accompanied with regulations to prevent evasions and to protect the consumer at the expense of the producer which greatly enhanced the deadly influence of the anomalous and incongruous accumulation of exactions. End of section 85. Recording by Mukund Manikar Nike from Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com. Section 86 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 9, Chapter 2, Conclusion, Retrospect, Part 2. All this fell with peculiar weight on agriculture and on the Labradors, or peasants on whom ultimately the support and prosperity of the nation depended. When, in 1619, the Royal Council, in obedience to the commands of Philip III, presented an elaborate consulta on the causes of depopulation, it commenced by ascribing this to grinding and insupportable taxation of the producing taxables and the exemption of the consuming classes. The mules and cart of the peasant were seized for taxes, he was driven from the land and hid himself in the large cities or sought a livelihood abroad. The warning was unheeded and ten years later, Fray Benito de Penalosa y Mondragon, while enthusiastically extolling the power and wealth of Spain, describes the condition of the Labradors as the poorest, most completely miserable and depressed of all, as though all the other classes had combined and conspired to ruin and destroy them. Their cabins and huts of mud walls are decaying and crumbling. They possess some badly cultivated lands and lean cattle, always hungry for lack of the common pasture, and they are burdened with tributes, mortgages, taxes, censes, and many impositions, demands and almsgivings that cannot be escaped. In place of wondering at the depopulation of villages and farms, the wonder is that any remain. Probably most of those who go to the colonies are Labradors and they also flock to the cities, engaging in all kinds of service. The process went on without interruption. A century later, an experienced financial official tells the same story in a report to Philip V. The burden of taxation fell upon the poor. All that was unpaid was added to the levy of the succeeding year. A horde of bloodsuckers lived by selling out delinquents when the costs amounted to more than the taxes. Consequently, the poor were obliged to sell their property to meet the demands of the tax gatherer or to let it be seized and sold, thus becoming beggars and tramps, and every year saw their numbers increase. The peasant, moreover, was subject to special and ruinous restrictions. The tassa, or the price of his grain, was officially determined every year, at a maximum above which he was forbidden to sell it. Moreover, he, it could not be exported, nor could it be transported by sea from one province to another to prevent infractions of the prohibition. The result of this was that if the harvest was deficient, grain was secreted and held at exorbitant prices, 
and this infraction of the law was winked at under necessity. The sufferer was the peasant who had not the means of storing his grain but had to sell it to the wealthy who could withhold it, and thus, whether the harvests were abundant or scanty, he fared ill. Thus production was discouraged and diminishing. The producer realized little while the consumer paid extravagantly, checking both production and consumption. Lands were left uncultivated and labor was unemployed. Everything moved in a vicious circle and the evil was constantly growing. Trade was similarly strangled. The Alcavala of 10% and the Cientos of 4% were levied on every transaction, no matter how often an article changed hands. Manufacturers under this system had almost disappeared. Spaniards were forced to sell their raw products to foreigners at low prices, for there were no other buyers and to purchase them back in their finished state at the seller's prices. The heavy tariff increased the cost to the consumer while innumerable smugglers enabled the importers to realize the benefit of the duties. The foreigner, moreover, secured all the precious metals of the Indies for all exports thither were of foreign goods, with which Spaniards could not compete owing to the excessive imposts and tributes which doubled the price of everything to the consumer yet of the product of these crushing burdens but little reached the treasury owing to the system of collection smuggling and frauds the disabilities thus imposed on agriculture industry and trade were greatly aggravated by the absence of means of intercommunication and it is symptomatic of spanish policy that the energies of the rulers were concentrated on the suppression of heresy foreign wars and court festivities to the exclusion of care for internal development it is true that under charles v and philip ii considerable effort was spent on the waterways the canal imperial de aragon was built along the ebro as well as the smaller canals of harama and manzanares and there were improvements in the navigation of the tagus and guadalquivir but these ceased and no attention was paid to the roads which for the most part were mere caminos de aradura or mule tracks even as late as seventeen ninety five jovellanos tells us that there was no communication by wagon between the contiguous provinces of leon and asturias so that the wines and wheat of castile could not bear the expense of mule carriage to the seaboard in seventeen sixty one carlos the third undertook to construct highways from madrid to andalusia valencia catalonia galicia old castile asturias murcia and extremadura but in seventeen ninety five none of them had reached halfway and no attention was paid to the interprovincial wagon roads to enable the miserable peasant to get from village to village or from market to market save at the cost of exhausting his cattle and at the risk of losing everything in a mud hole another intolerable burden on agriculture was the mesta or combination of owners of the immense flocks of sheep which wintered in the lowlands and summered in the mountains through privileges dating from the fourteenth century and gradually increased the provinces through which the trashumantes or migratory flocks passed were subject to serious disabilities pasturage could not be broken up for cultivation its rental was fixed by an unalterable tassa and a mestaino tenant could not be evicted all enclosures were forbidden in order that the flocks when migrating might feed without payment on the stubble in the autumn and on the fallow land in the spring although this privilege was somewhat curtailed in seventeen eighty eight by permitting the enclosure of orchards vineyards and plantations thus the husbandman was deprived of control over his property and the raising of horses and of stationary herds of cattle and sheep 
vastly more important than the trashumantes, was effectually discouraged within the range of the Mesta. Equally short-sighted were the forestry laws designed to foster the production of lumber, which was greatly needed both for building and shipping. The owner was obliged to get and pay for a permit before he could fell a tree to obey fixed rules as to pruning to sell against his will and at a fixed price, to admit inspections and official visits, and to answer for the condition and number of his trees, thus opening the door to unlimited extortion. In short, the freedom of action through which men seek their interests and thus contribute to the general welfare was destroyed by the paternalism of an absolute government, which blindly hampered all improvement and checked all individual initiative and ambition. This explains the despoblados and baldios, the depopulated villages and uncultivated lands, which were the despair of the statesmen who discussed the possible regeneration of Spain. According to Zavala, in the circumscription of Barajos alone, the baldios amounted to over 300 square leagues, mostly good farmland, in which the remains of buildings could be traced but then grown up in copses and thickets, affording refuge to wolves, smugglers, and robbers. In Andalusia, Javalinus tells us that these baldios were immense. They were less in Extremadura, La Mancha, and the two Castiles, while in the northern provinces from the Pyrenees to Portugal, the population was denser and the baldios less frequent and of inferior quality. We have seen the attempt made by Carlos III to reclaim these districts with the Nuevas Poblaciones and how the promising experiment was checked by the Inquisition. As though these blind and irrational policies were insufficient to destroy prosperity, an equally efficient factor was devised in tampering with the coinage. This began tentatively in 1566 by Philip II in diminishing the alloy of silver in the vellon or copper coinage. In 1602, Philip III, in his financial distress, was bolder and resolutely issued a pure copper coinage with a fictitious value of 7 to 2, calling forth the protest of Padre Mariana, which cost him his prosecution by the Inquisition. In 1605, the Luchess envoy informs us that the treasury had already reaped a profit of 25 million ducats by this fiat money, of which the mark cost 80 marvedis and had a forced circulation of 280. This was the first of a long series of violent measures continued throughout the 17th century of alternate expansion and contraction. Thus, in 1642, the fictitious legal tender value was suddenly reduced to one-sixth, followed in 1643 by raising it fourfold, and in 1651 by increasing it still further. In 1652, an attempt was made to demonetize the well on June 25th, which was abandoned November 14th. In 1659, the well on Grueso was reduced in value one half, and in 1660 it was trebled. Attempts were made to regulate prices by decrease of maxima and to prevent or define the inevitable premium on gold and silver, but the unwritten laws of trade were imperative until at last, in 1718, the Real de Plata was admitted to be worth twice the Real de Vellon, a ratio which remained nearly permanent. The largest Vellon coin was the Quartillo, or a fourth of a real, equivalent to about three cents of American money, which became the standard value in Spanish trade. The coins were tied in bags of definite amount and these passed from hand to hand, for the precious metals necessarily disappeared and were rarely seen except in Seville in spite of the most savage decrees against their exportation. It would be impossible to exaggerate the disastrous influence on industry and commerce of these perpetual fluctuations of the circulating medium, 
the relations between debtor and creditor, between producer and consumer, were ever at the mercy of some new decree that might upset all calculations. All transactions from the purchase of a day's supply of bread to a contract for a cargo of merchandise were mere gambling speculations. End of section 86. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com. Section 87 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9. Chapter 2 Conclusion Retrospect Part 3 These causes of decadence were accentuated by an aversion and contempt for labor, which was organized as a Spanish characteristic, attributable perhaps to the long war of reconquest and the endless civil broils which rendered arms the only fitting career for a Spaniard and accustomed him to see all useful work performed by those whom he regarded as belonging to inferior races, Jews and Mudahars. Their expulsion was destructive to all industrial pursuits, but the old Christians still looked down on the descendants of the conversos, who were, to a large extent, debarred by the statutes of Limpieza, from the Spanish resource of living without labor by entering the church or holding office. The evil effects of this were intensified by constitutional indolence. The Spanish conquistadors gave memorable examples of indefatigable energy and hardihood, sparing no toil when their imaginations were inflamed with the lust of conquest or the hopes of gold but they would not work as colonists. One of them, Bernardo de Vargas Machuca, who for 30 years was governor of Margarita, defends the enslavement of the Indians by candidly saying that Spaniards would not settle on unoccupied land, no matter how healthy or how rich in gold and silver, but would go where there were Indians, even if the land were sterile and unhealthy. For if they had not Indians to work for them, they could not enjoy its products, and its possession would be no benefit. Nor were the Spaniards, of whom he speaks, gentlemen adventurers, but were mostly drawn from the humbler classes. It was the same at home. Already in 1512, Guicciardini, who spent two years in Spain as envoy from Florence, describes Spain as a land rich in natural resources, but sparsely populated and largely undeveloped. The people, he says, are warlike and skilled in arms, but they look upon industry and trade with disdain. Artisans and husbandmen will work only under pressure of necessity and then rest in idleness until their earnings are spent. The Cortes of Valladolid in 1548 complained that agricultural laborers and mechanics would not come to work before 10 or 11 o'clock and would break off an hour or two before sunset. A century later, Dormer, the historiographer of Aragon, reproves the indolence of the people except in Catalonia, for they would not work as was customary in other lands, but only a few hours a day with perhaps frequent intermissions, and they expected this to provide for them as fully as the incessant labor of other lands. Spanish indolence was a frequent theme with the Venetian envoys who described Spain as abounding in resources and able to supply all its needs, but dependent upon foreign nations in consequence of the rooted dislike for labor. As Gianfrancesco Morosini writes in 1581, the people have little aptitude for any of the mechanic arts 
and are mostly negligent in agriculture, while in manual labor they are so slow and lazy that what anywhere else would be done in a month, here takes four. The Lutch's envoys in the next century tell the same story. There are few Spaniards, they say, except office holders who will work. The greater part of the workmen are foreigners who have made a new Spain to the great detriment of the old kingdoms. This explains why Spain is only a port through which the precious metals pass. The Spaniards consume only foreign merchandise imported by foreign merchants. Among the contractors, there is not a single Castilian, and there are more pieces of eight in China than in Spain. So, in 1687, Luis de Salzar y Castro attributes the decline of the monarchy to its substance flowing out through every pore, and the ultimate cause of this is the lack of energy. I say it is our indolence, ignorance, and want of application. We attribute to deficient population what is laziness and sloth. Could our torpidity go further than our requiring Frenchmen to make tiles, to grind knives, to carry water, and to knead bread? A moralist of the period is excessively severe upon this indolence coupled with reckless extravagance, which he compares with the tireless industry and thrift of the Frenchmen. To this, he attributes the poverty of Spain, as we have seen, had been done in 1594 by Francisco de Ediaques, the secretary of Philip II. One development of this indisposition to labor is touched upon by the consulta of the royal council in 1619, when it alludes to the multiplication of grammar schools to which the peasants sent their children for a smattering of education and thus withdraw them from productive industry. The Cortes of the same year asked for restrictions on this, and Navarrete, in his commentary on the consulta, dwells at some length on the evils thence arising, for the sons of peasants flock thither to gain the exemptions of the learned classes. An infinite number of them fail to reach the priesthood, becoming beggars and vagrants and criminals, while many of those who enter orders are forced to dishonorable practices, the public suffering in consequence from the lack of laborers and artisans. Protests were in vain, and in 1753, Gregorio Mines y Cesar still called attention to the crowds of half-educated students who sponged on the community, drones who sucked the honey while they might be of service in driving a plow or handling a musket, a complaint echoed with still greater vigor by Jovellanos in 1795. To this tendency may be attributed the frenzied rush for office, to which the suggestive name of empleomania has been given, burdening the state with a vast superfluity of employees and depriving it of their services in useful production. In 1674, the Lutches envoy wonders at the revenues estimated at 75 millions without apparent result, which he ascribes partly to the waste in collecting the collectors employed numbering 200,000, a manifest exaggeration, but yet suggestive. About 1740, Macanez ranks this as the first in his enumeration of the causes of Spain's condition. There are, he says, a thousand employees where 40 would suffice if they were kept at work and the rest would be at some useful labor. The evil still continues, if we may believe modern writers, who regard it as one of the serious impediments to prosperity. From the depth of poverty, disorder, and humiliation to which Spain had fallen, the process of recuperation under the Bourbons was slow and at first vacillating. Something was accomplished by Philip V in spite of his continual wars and his melancholy madness when he had rid himself of such adventurers as Alberoni and Ripperda and gave scope to the practical genius of Patino, 
The upward impulse continued under Fernando VII, while under Carlos III and his enlightened ministers, the progress was rapid. A memorial addressed by Florida Blanca to the king towards the close of his reign enumerates the reforms and works of utility undertaken during his ministry. There were canals both for navigation and irrigation, the drainage of marshlands, the establishment of the Nuevas Publicians, the improvement of roads. The trade to the colonies was thrown open to all the ports instead of being restricted to several, with the result that the exports quickly trebled and the customs revenue doubled. The Banco Nacional was founded and the public credit, which had fallen very low, was speedily restored. Insurance companies were established and other trading associations, which gave life to industry and commerce. The tariff on imports was rendered uniform at all the ports, and its schedules were arranged so as to foster internal development, being light on machinery and raw materials, and heavy on articles produced in Spain, not only stimulating industry to great prosperity of the land, but increasing the customs revenue to 130 millions, when it had previously never exceeded 30 millions in the most prosperous years. The complicated and burdensome rentas provinciales were regulated so as to fall equally on the provinces and to be easily borne. The milones were reduced one half. The formalities of the alcavala were simplified and its percentage greatly reduced so as to bear lightly on the industry and with the expectation of its abrogation. The numbers of the exempts were diminished. All the mechanic arts were habilitated, so that nobles engaging in them should not forfeit their nobility, thus taking away the excuse for idleness. And vice of those who call themselves noble and refuse to work, however poor they might be. Through this policy, during the reign of Carlos III, the population of peninsular Spain increased by a million and a half, and under his guidance, it emerged from the Middle Ages and began to take position with modern nations. Much as had thus been accomplished, much remained to do, as set forth in 1795 by Jovellanos in his celebrated inform. Unfortunately, progress was arrested by the indolent Carlos IV and his favorite Godoy. Then came the Napoleonic Wars, and the course of events, as traced in the preceding chapter, was not conducive to improvement. Yet in all the vicissitudes which Spain has endured since then, if we may trust the growth of population as an index of advancement, the substitution of liberal institutions for absolutism has proved a success and, however real may be the abuses of which the reforming element complains, the present situation is vastly better than the past. The census of 1768 showed a total of 9,309,804, that of 1787, 10,409,879 that of 1799, something over 12 million. Yet, in spite of Carlist wars and political troubles in 1885, it had risen to 17,228,776, and it is now reckoned at 19 million, or about double that of the period of Spanish greatness. The fair inference from this is that Spain has a future, that while much remains to do, much has been accomplished, and there is progress which, if continued, will restore in great measure her ancient strength, although the enormous growth of modern nations precludes the expectation that she can resume her commanding position. End of section 87 Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com Section 88 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Mukund Mani Karnike, Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 9, Chapter 2, Conclusion, Retrospect, Part 4. In addition to these secular causes of Spanish decadence, there remains to be considered another class of no less importance, those arising from clericalism or the relations of the church to the state and its influence on the popular character and tendencies. The accumulation of lands and wealth by the church and especially by the religious orders was from an early time a source of concern to statesmen and of complaint by the people for the exemption from the royal jurisdiction from military service and from taxation claimed as imprescriptible rights by the church weakened the power of the state and threw increased burdens upon the population almost all the european nations endeavored to curb this acquisitiveness by laws of which the english statutes of mortmain and the French Tocqua de Amortissement may be taken as examples. These acquisitions came from two sources, each abundantly productive, gifts or bequests and purchase. The sinner, unable to redeem in money the canonical penance for his sins impossible to perform, would make over a piece of land and obtain absolution, or, if on his deathbed, would bequeath a portion of his estate to be expended in masses for his soul, perhaps founding a capellania for that purpose, or as provision for a son who would serve as chaplain. So audacious became the demands of the church on the estates of the dying that, in 1348, the Cortes of Alcala, complained that all the orders obtained from the royal chancery letters empowering them to examine all testaments, whereupon they claimed all bequests made to uncertain places or persons. Also, if there was not a bequest for each order, those omitted demanded one equal to the largest in the will, and they further claimed the whole estates of those who died intestate if these demands were contested they varied the heirs with litigation into a compromise alfonso promised to revoke all such letters but the black death which speedily followed brought an immense accretion of lands for the foundation of anniversaries and chaplaincies which led to lively reclamations of the cortes of valladolid in 1351 with wealth thus constantly accumulating the church or monastery would purchase lands from the laity, and as these became exempt from taxation, it could afford to pay more than a secular purchaser. Whatever thus passed into ecclesiastical possession was never alienated. It remained in the grip of the dead hand, which by constant accretions came to hold a large portion of the most desirable lands, and thus of the wealth of the kingdom. It would be tedious to recapitulate the complaints of the Cortes and the devices attempted by legislation from the 11th century onward to check this growth, which was regarded as threatening the most serious evils to the nation. Laws were adopted only to be evaded or forgotten, and the process went on. A new element, however, was injected into the struggle when, in 1438, the Cortes of Madrigal made a vigorous representation to Juan II that if no remedy were applied, all the best lands in the kingdom would belong to the church, resulting in manifold injury to the people and the crown, to which the feeble king evasively replied that he would apply to the pope. Hitherto, Spanish independence of the papacy had regarded all such questions as subject to national regulation, but this utterance indicated that papal confirmation was beginning to be recognized as necessary in everything that affected the church. This was not at once admitted, for one in 1447 in response to the Cortes of Valladolid, and by a decree of 1452, 
imposed a tax of 20% on all purchases, bequests, and donations, but it gradually established itself and furnished a ready answer to the vigorous representations which, with growing insistence, the Cortes of the 16th century made in 1515, 1518, 1523, 1528, 1532, 1534, 1537, 1538, 1542, 1544, 1551, and 1573. This put all remedy out of the question, for no pope could be expected to set limits to ecclesiastical wealth and influence, from which the curia derived its revenues and the petitions of the Cortes served only to emphasize the magnitude of the evil and its universal recognition by the people. It was not only the progressive absorption of wealth and land that was detrimental, but the corresponding increase in the numbers of the clergy, regular and secular, who were released from all the duties of the citizen and whose vows of celibacy aided in accelerating the diminution of the population. The process continued with added vigor, especially after the commencement of the 17th century, owing partly to a wave of religious fervor which led to the founding of chapels and convents on a greater scale than ever, and partly to the growing destitution forcing men to seek conventional refuge where they might at least escape starvation and inducing parents to give their sons such smattering of education as might enable them to take orders and have at least a chance to secure a livelihood free from the crushing burdens of taxation. The result of this is seen in Frey Bleda's boast in 1618 that one-fourth of the Christians of Spain were priests, frails or nuns, and even though this is obviously an overestimate, it indicates how great was the task imposed on the producing classes to support in idleness so large a portion of the population. The increase was largely in the mendicant orders whose systematic begging that no one dared refuse was a grievous addition to the tithes and first fruits. A single instance will illustrate this inordinate growth. Cardinal Mendoza, Archbishop of Toledo, the third king under Ferdinand and Isabella, stubbornly refused to allow convents to be founded in his province, saying that there were already many that were injurious to the people obliged to sustain them, but this ceased with his death in 1495. His biographer, Dr. Pedro de Salazar, penitentiary of the cathedral, tells us that the city of Toledo had a privilege from Alfonso X prohibiting the erection of convents there. At that time there were six, but in 1625, when he wrote, these had been enlarged and numerous others had been founded, so that they then occupied more than 50 royal and noble houses and more than 600 smaller ones. The disastrous influence of this on the prosperity of the place is self-evident and Salazar regards this portentous development of ecclesiasticism as the chief cause of the decline in population of Spain, which he estimates at 25%. The consulta of the Council of Castile in 1619 naturally included in its enumeration of the causes of national distress the foundation of so many religious houses, which were filled with those attracted not by vocation but by a life of idleness, while their lands were exempt from taxation. In a similar mood, the Cortes assembled by Philip IV on his accession made a forcible and somewhat rhetorical representation asking for measures to restrain the multiplication of foundations and the purchases of land which not only diminished the alcavalas but in a few years would exempt all real estate from the royal jurisdiction and accumulate all taxation on the miserable poor thus destroying the population of the provinces 
for it was evident that if the clergy continued to increase as it was doing, the villages would be without inhabitants, the fields without laborers, the sea without mariners, and the arts without craftsmen. Commerce would be extinct and marriage being despised, the world would not last for a century. At the earnest request of the kingdom, which represented that it could not support these idle multitudes or furnish soldiers for war, Urban VIII in 1634 granted a bold reforming the religious orders and suppressing some of the barefooted ones. But the opposing influences were too strong and it was ineffective. In 1677, the matter was again debated, including the excessive numbers of the secular clergy, but action was postponed until there was a better prospect of results. The recognized evils were too serious to remain thus pigeonholed, and an attempt was again made in 1691. The feebleness of which demonstrates how completely the church dominated the state and could not be reformed without its own consent. The king deplored the multiplication of convents and the consequent relaxation of discipline, and the pope was to be asked for authority to appoint visitors with full powers. The excessive increase of the secular priesthood, he said, was the cause of numerous disorders, to cure which the pope was to be applied to for faculties enabling bishops and abbots to reduce their numbers, so that all incumbents could live decently. The clergy in minor orders were so numerous that their exemption from the royal jurisdiction and the public burdens was a grievous injury to the laity and the bishops were asked to limit their ordination. The absorption of lands by the church was an evil which had puzzled the wisest heads in all ages. Many states had adopted laws regulating this, but he hesitated to have recourse to such measures until statistics could be gathered, and it could be decided how to reduce the numbers of the secular clergy. In short, the church was an old man of the sea, strangling the state, which lacked power to rid itself of its oppressor. With the advent of the Bourbons, there was less tendency to this hopelessness, and in 1713, the plain-spoken Macanez, in a report to the king, presented a terrible picture of the misery and impoverishment resulting from the overgrown numbers and wealth of the clergy. Yet, short of revolution, effective remedy was impossible, and Philip V contended himself with a decree expressing regret that, without papal assent or a concordat, he could not afford general relief to his vassals. While awaiting this, However, he severely characterized the frauds of confessors in inducing the dying to impoverish their heirs. Such testators were declared not to be of free will, their bequests were invalid, and scriveners drawing them were threatened with condign punishment. Much of this evil could have been averted had the salutary reforms prescribed by the Council of Trent been enforced, but they had been a dead letter, at least in Spain. In 1723, however, Philip induced the Spanish bishops to supplicate Innocent XIII on the subject, resulting in a constitution in which he embodied at great length the Tridentine decrees as to restricting ordinations and the number of religious in convents. It was a tribute to the capacious learning rather than to the consistency of Macanaz that the regular orders employed him to draw up a memorial to the king protesting against the enforcement of the papal decree in which he lavished praises on them and argued vigorously against any restriction on numbers beyond the capacity of support. This, however, 
was but a lawyer's argument for a client and did not prevent him in memorials to Philip V about 1740 and to Fernando VI in 1746 from expressing his true opinions as to the evils which were a main cause of Spanish distress. More than half the land held in Mortmain and exempt from public burdens and the immense number of those who, in place of being good laborers, were bad priests, wandering around as beggars to the scandal of religion, while the overgrown religious orders were useless consumers living on the rest of the nation. End of section 88. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com. Section 89 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9. Chapter 2 Conclusion Retrospect Part 5 In negotiating the Concordat of 1737, Philip obtained with difficulty a concession subjecting to taxation future acquisitions, but it was impossible of enforcement and repeated decrees by him in 1745, by Fernando VII in 1756, and by Carlos III in 1760 and 1763, only attest the powerlessness of the state when dealing with the church. In 1795, Godoy dallied with a project of secularizing church property to meet the expenses of the disastrous war with France, but was obliged to abandon the project and only imposed a tax of 15% on new acquisitions. It was inevitable that the Cortes of Cadiz and the constitutional government of 1820 to 1823 should partially carry out what Spanish publicists for centuries had demanded and should earn the bitterest clerical hostility. As a matter of course, the wealth of so numerous, powerful, and worldly a church was enormous. As early as 1563, Paolo Tiepolo states that the clergy possessed little less than one-half the total revenues of Spain. He rates the income of the Archbishop of Toledo at 150,000 ducats, and in addition the Church of Toledo had 300,000. Exemption from public burdens gave ample opportunity of increase, and at the end of the 18th century, the archbishop was estimated as enjoying an income of half a million dollars. Navarrete, in 1624, regards as one of the leading causes of the hatred entertained for the church by the laity the contrast between its affluence and the general poverty. Nor is this unlikely for, during the worst periods of national disaster, the church seems always to have enjoyed superabundant resources. As its income, other than the produce of its lands, was largely derived from tithes, it necessarily varied from year to year, but was always enormous. In 1653, we find Placencia spoken of as one of the four most lucrative bishoprics in Spain, with an income of 40,000 ducats, but that there were years in which it had been worth 80,000 and this at a time when the state was virtually bankrupt, the currency in frightful disorder, commerce and industry prostrate, and the whole land steeped in poverty. Against this, it is true, must be set the habit of the monarch in calling upon the bishops as well as on the nobles for contributions, as we have seen in the case of Valdez. Thus, Cardinal Quiroga, when Archbishop of Toledo from 1577 to 1594, is said to have given to Philip II an aggregate of a million and a half ducats, 
there were also certain papal grants to the crown on the revenues of the clergy at large, known as the subsidio and the excusado, which in 1573 were reckoned at 575,000 crowns a year, and in 1658 at something over 2 million ducats. It betrays a consciousness of overgrown wealth, that all knowledge of its amount was carefully concealed. In 1741, Benedict the Fourteenth granted to Philip the Fifth eight percent of the revenues of the clergy, regular and secular, for that year. The collection of this in Granada was delegated with full coercive powers to the archdeacon Juan Bautista Simoni, who, after Easter 1742, issued an edict requiring all incumbents within 10 days to render sworn statements of their property and income. This aroused intense excitement. Under one pretext or another, all from the archbishop down endeavored to escape the revelation of their wealth. There were meetings held and open threats were made of a cesario et divinis if the measure was insisted on. A compromise was offered of payment of a double servicio, which was assumed to be equivalent to 8%, but they refused absolutely to make a return of property and income. Simony seems to have been sincerely desirous of executing his unpleasant duty with as little friction as possible, but in reporting this repugnance to make sworn statements, he does not hesitate to say that its object was to prevent the king from learning that about three-fourths of all the property in Spain was in the hands of the clergy secular and regular, and especially of the Carthusians, Jesuites, Geronimites, and Dominicans. It proved to be impossible to compel the archbishop to make the return, and finally it was compromised by taking the average of a valuation made during five years of a vacancy, 1728 to 1732, which resulted in estimating the revenues of the sea at about 39,000 ducats, evidently an undervaluation, although Grenada was reckoned as the poorest of the five Castilian archbishoprics. All this wealth and splendor was drawn in its ultimate source from the labor of the husbandmen and the administration of the sacraments, casting a grievous burden on the industry of the land, and counting for much in the general impoverishment. When the little development of Protestantism in 1558 excited so much dread, it was assumed as a matter of course that the people would welcome a reform that would bring relief from the burdens of the church establishment. Jovellanos asks what is left of the ancient glory of Castile save the skeletons of its cities, once populous and full of workshops and stores, and now filled with churches, convents, and hospitals, which survive the misery that they have caused. So in 1820, the learned canon Francisco Martinez Marina, in indicating the measures necessary to restore prosperity, says that the first one is to reduce the wealth of the clergy for the benefit of agriculture and the poor and oppressed peasant, and to abolish forever the unjust, insupportable tribute of the tithe, a tribute unknown to Spain before the 12th century, a tribute which directly prevents the progress of agriculture and one of those which have inflicted the greatest misery on the husbandmen. A clergy thus worldly and so far removed from apostolic poverty was not apt to be devoted to its duties or set an example of morality to its subjects. A project drawn up by a Spanish bishop of matters to be urged on the Council of Lateran in 1512 affords a glimpse into the deplorable condition of the church which was so deeply concerned with the salvation of the Maranos and Moriscos. Few among the laity observed the prescribed fasts and feasts, and even the Easter communion was neglected. 
The priests were negligent, and even in cathedrals, it was sometimes difficult to have divine service performed. Among the clergy, from bishops to the lower orders, concubinage was universal and shameless, while simony ruled everywhere. The provisions of the Council of Seville in 1512 and of Coria in 1537 indicate the vicious and degraded character of the priesthood and the impossibility of restraining their habitual concubinage. Alfonso de Castro argues that if it were not for the protection of God, it would be difficult to preserve religion in view of the unworthiness of the priests and their wickedness. It is known to all, he says, that the contempt felt for them arises first from their excessive numbers, secondly from their ignorance, and lastly from their flagitious lives. Archbishop Carranza is emphatic in reproving the negligence of the clerics who were so indifferent to their duty that they abandoned their churches and might as well be non-existent, in addition to which were their civil and scandalous lives and the abuse of their wealth. This is confirmed by Inquisitor General Valdez, who states that when in 1546 he assumed the archbishopric of Seville, he found the clergy and the dignitaries of his cathedral thoroughly demoralized. They had no shame in their children and grandchildren. Their women lived with them openly as though married and accompanied them to church and many of them kept public gambling tables in their houses, which were resorts of disorderly characters. If we may believe him, he resolutely undertook a reform and effected it at great labor and expense, owing to appeals and suits in Rome and in Granada, and in the royal council and before apostolic judges. Then Francisco de Erasso, a favorite of Charles V, obtained a canonry and joined those who re desired to return to their former dissolute life against which, in 1556, he appeals to Philip II for protection. The lower ranks of the clergy were no better if we may believe the Synod of Orevala in 1600, which asserts that their concubinage was the cause of the animosity of the people against them. And we have seen, when treating of solicitation, how frequent was the advantage taken of the opportunities of the confessional. There were few prelates as conscientious as Valdez represents himself. Alfonso de Castro attributes the existence of heresy to their negligence. They were so slothful that they paid no attention to their duties. Those who did otherwise were so rare that they were like jewels among pebbles. The Venetian envoy Giovanni Soranzo is less cautious in his utterance, for he describes them as living luxuriously and squandering their revenues on splendid establishments. Few of them were without children, in whom they took no shame and for whose advancement they employed every means. At the other end of the scale were the clerks in the lower orders immersed in secular affairs, who took the tonsure in order to enjoy the protection from justice afforded by the church. These were the despair of those responsible for public order. Fernando de Aragon, Viceroy of Valencia, complains, August 21st, 1544, of the impossibility of enforcing justice owing to the zeal with which the church authorities protected the tonsure, whether right or wrong. The officials of the archbishoprics, he says, have been debased and ignorant men whose sole aim has been to save criminals from the punishment of their crimes. He is encouraged to hope for better things from the appointment as Archbishop of San Tomas de Villanova and later follows September 8th with allusions to his own sufferings in consequence of his efforts to remedy this condition, 
which is an offense to justice and to God and a great damage to the people. A church composed of such elements was not fitted to exercise for good the enormous influence which it enjoyed over public affairs, not only in shaping the policy of the kingdom but in directing the national tendencies. The theory was still the medieval one that the ecclesiastical power is the sun and the royal power the moon which derives its light from the sun. To its influence, as represented by Torquemada, was due the expulsion of the Jews by Jimenez, the enforced conversion of the Moors by Espinosa, the rebellion of Granada by Juan de Ribera and his fellows, the expulsion of the Moriscos. In the royal councils which formed a bureaucracy, prelates held leading and often dominant positions, and their subordinates were largely drawn from clerical ranks. In 1602, a proposition to increase the schools of artillery was referred to a junta presided over by the royal confessor, which reported that the expense could not be afforded. The schools came to be under the charge of Jesuits and frails and speedily dwindled to nothing. The position of royal confessor was one of the highest political importance. Under Charles V, he participated in all deliberations and had a preponderating influence. Under Philip II, this confessor, Fray Diego de Chavez, played a leading part in the tragedy of Antonio Perez, Fray Gaspar de Toledo, confessor of Philip III, boasted that whenever he told the king that a thing must be done under pain of mortal sin or that it was sinful, he was obeyed without discussion. The regent Maria Anna of Austria was completely under the domination of her confessor Nithard and the letters to him of Clement the Eleventh on European politics indicate that he was the real ruler. The substitution of Froilan Diaz for Fray Pedro Matila as confessor of Carlos the Second was the only step necessary to effect a revolution in the government, and when Diaz fled to Rome, he was reclaimed as a fugitive chief minister of state. We have seen under Philip V the power wielded by his confessors, Dobenton and Robinet, and the part played by Rabago under Fernando VI. What thus ruled the court was perpetually at work in every parish and every family where the pulpit and the confessional exercised an incalculable influence. What the Spaniard became was what the church wished him to be. Clericalism thus, for good or for evil, was a leading factor in controlling the destinies of Spain in exhausting its resources, in molding the character of its people, and the Inquisition was its crowning work. End of section 89. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com. Section 90 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. By Henry Charles Lee. Book 9. Chapter 2. Conclusion. Retrospect. Part 6. Under such influences, the toleration which had been so marked a feature of the medieval period gradually gave place to a fanaticism finding its expression in the Inquisition and inflamed into greater fierceness by the existence and reaction of that institution. 
there can be no question as to the sincere devoutness of Charles V, according to the unanimous testimony of the Venetian envoys, who describe his punctual discharge of all religious observances and who state the surest avenue to his favor was the manifestation of earnest zeal for religion. Shortly before his death, he expressed deep regret that he had not executed Luther at Worms, in spite of his pledged safe conduct, for he ought to have forfeited his word in order to avenge the offense to God. In his will, executed in 1554 at Brussels, he charged Philip II in the most earnest manner to favor in all ways the Inquisition, because of the many and great offenses to God, which it prevents or punishes, and in the codicil of September 9, 1558, dictated on his deathbed, his first thought is to repeat the injunction and to urge his son, by the obedience due to a father, to prosecute heresy rigorously, unsparingly, and relentlessly. Philip II needed no such exhortations. From his earliest youth, he had breathed an atmosphere surcharged by the conflict with heresy. He had been taught that a sovereign's highest duty to God and man was to enforce unity of faith, not only as a paramount religious obligation, but because it was an axiom of the statesmanship of the time that in no other way could the peace of a kingdom be preserved. There is no reason to doubt his perfect sincerity when, in 1568, the Archduke Charles came to Spain as the representative of the German princes to urge an accommodation with the Netherlands and Philip, besides his formal reply, gave the Archduke secret instructions to tell the Emperor that no human influence or considerations of state or all that the whole world could say or do would make him vary a hair's breadth from the course which he had adopted and intended to pursue in this matter of religion throughout all his dominions, that he would listen to no advice with regard to it and would take ill any that might be offered. At the same time, he wrote to Chantenay, his ambassador at Vienna, that what he was doing in the Netherlands was for their advantage and the preservation of the Catholic faith, and that he would make no change in his policy if it involved risking all his possessions and if the whole world would fall upon his head. So, in 1574, the instructions to the commissioners sent to Breda to confer with the deputies of William the Silent were to declare emphatically that he would suffer no one to live under his throne was not completely a Catholic. Philip was merely translating into practice the teachings of the Church and won its unstinted admiration. Cardinal Pallavicini contrasts the vacillating persecution in France with his sanguinary rigor, which was not only grateful to heaven but propitious to his kingdom, thus saved by salutary bloodletting. It was natural that Philip, in his will, executed March 7, 1594, should reiterate to his son and successor the injunctions which he had received from his father. The Inquisition was to be with the object of special favor, even greater than in the past, for the times were perilous and full of so many errors in faith. Philip III had not energy enough to be an active persecutor, and if, under the guidance of Lerma, he expelled the Moriscos under the same tutelage he made peace with England in 1605 and a truce with Holland in 1609, to the disgust of the pious who could not understand any dealings with heretics. Yet he was a most religious prince who spent hours every day in his devotions and in examining his conscience, and who set a shining example by the frequency with which he sought confession and communion. It was a matter, of course, that he should, in his will, leave to his successor the customary instructions to foster the Inquisition. 
As to Philip the Fourth, we have seen abundant instances of his subservience to it during his half century of reign, and of his readiness to subordinate to it all other interests. He showed his consistency in this when, at the dictation of the Suprema, he incurred a war with England through his refusal to sign a treaty forbidding the persecution of Englishmen in Spain on account of their religion and in his will, executed in 1665, he said the customary injunctions on his successor to aid and favor the Inquisition, adding an exhortation to honor and defend the clergy in all their exemptions and immunities and earnestly to labor for the reformation of religious orders. Carlos II was a non-entity who need not be considered, and with the Bourbons, we enter on the dawn of a new era in which fanaticism no longer dominates the policy of the state. It is true that Philip V, when abdicating in 1724, enjoined on his son Louis the preservation of the faith through the instrumentality of the Inquisition as fervently as any of his predecessors and that during the first third of the century there was a fierce recrudescence of inquisitorial activity but we have seen how the spirit of the age gradually made itself felt and although the duty of exterminating heresy was still admitted in theory in practice its enforcement was greatly mitigated it is difficult for us in the indifferentism of the twentieth century to realize or to understand the violence of the passions excited by the questions of faith dissociated from all temporal interests and their influence on a people so emotional as the Spaniards, and so apt as they tell us themselves to be swayed by imagination rather than by reason. We have seen the whole kingdom of Portugal thrown into excitement by the theft of a pex with a consecrated host and that only the opportune discovery of the culprit saved all the new christians from expulsion it might seem to us a very trivial affair that on the eve of good friday sixteen forty there was posted in the chapter house of Grenada a placard ridiculing the christian religion praising the mosaic law and blaspheming the purity of the virgin but it produced the greatest excitement throughout spain special services were held in all the churches to appease the insulted deity and to discover the malefactor he was detected in the person of a hermit of the santa imagine del triufno who was arrested and Inquisitor Rodesno deemed it advisable to break the inviolable secrecy of the Inquisition in order to calm the public agitation by letting the people know that the culprit had been discovered and convicted. Learned doctors improved the occasion by printing dissertations in which it was proved that he must be burned alive if no death more atrocious could be invented to suit the crime. The fanatical hatred of heresy per se, thus sedulously inculcated and ingrained in the moral fiber of every Spaniard, is seen in the statutes of Limpieza, which close the avenues to distinction to the descendants of conversos and of those who had been penanced by the Inquisition, so that even arrest and imprisonment for a trivial offense inflicted according to popular prejudice and indelible stigma on a family we have seen to what insane extent this was carried and what evil it wrought in the social organization but more prolific in evil was the habit of thought by which it was engendered and which it intensified yet practically the religion which was so sensitive to purity of faith was of a very superficial character 
External observances were strictly enforced, and the Inquisition was ever on the watch to punish any irreverence in act or word. Yet Alfonso de Castro tells us that in the mountainous provinces such as Asturias, Galicia, and elsewhere, the word of God was so rarely preached to the people that they observed many pagan rites and many superstitions. To labor on Sunday or feast day was a serious offense involving suspicion of heresy, yet Carranza says that more offenses against God were committed on Sundays than in the all week days combined. Those who went to Mass mostly spent the time in business or in talking or sleeping. Those who did not go gratified their vanity or their appetites. The ancient Jews used to say that on their feast days, the demons left the cities for refuge in the mountain caves. But now it would seem that on weekdays, the demons avoided the people who were busy with their labors and on feast days came trooping joyfully from the deserts, for then they find the doors open to all kinds of vices. Paolo Tiepolo in 1563 observes that in all external signs of religion, the Spaniards are exceedingly devout, but he doubts whether the interior corresponds. The clergy live as they choose without anyone reprehending them, and he is scandalized by the buffooneries and burlesques performed in the churches on feast days. The churches, in fact, seem to have been places for everything save devotion. Apelaqueta describes the profane observances during divine service, the inattention of the priests, the processions of masks and demons, the banquets and feastings, and other disgraceful profanations, so that there are few of the faithful who do not sin in church, and few who do not utter idle, vain, foul, evil, or profane words. In hot weather, the coolness of the churches made them favorite lounging places for both sexes, including monks and nuns, and much that was indecent occurred. They were, moreover, places for the transaction of business, and more bargaining took place here than in the markets. This was not a mere passing custom. A century later, Francisco Santos pictures for us a church crowded with so-called worshippers, where the services could scarce be heard for the noise, beggars crying for arms and wrangling among themselves, two men quarrelling fiercely and on the point of drawing their swords, a group of young gallants chattering and maltreating a poor man, who had chanced to touch them in passing, people leaving one mass that had commenced to follow a priest who had the reputation of greater dispatch in his sacred functions. In a chapel, a bevy of fair ladies drinking chocolate, discussing fashions and waited on by their admirers, all is worldly and the religious observance is the merest pretext. This irreverence was shared by the priests. A brief of Urban the Eighth, January 30, 1642, recites complaints from the dean and chapter of Seville concerning the use of tobacco in the churches, both in smoking and snuffing, even by priests while celebrating mass, and of their profanation of the sacred cloths by using them and staining them with tobacco. Therefore he decrees excommunication letter sententia for the use of the weed within the sacred precincts. It is evident that the Inquisition, while enforcing conformity as to dogma and outward observance, failed to inspire genuine respect for religion. End of section 90 Recording by Mukund Manikarnike, Tempe, Arizona, mmanikar.com Section number 91 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 2, Part 7, Conclusion. Retrospect. It will thus be seen how little really was gained for religion by the spirit of fierce intolerance largely responsible for the material causes of decadence which we have passed rapidly in review. The irrational resolve to enforce unity of faith at every cost spurred Ferdinand and Isabella to burn and pauperize those among their subjects who were not most economically valuable, to expel those who could not be reduced to conformity and to institute a system of confiscation of which we have seen the destructive influence on industry and on the credit on which commerce and industry depend, while the application of this to the condemnation of the dead not only brought misery on innocent descendants, but unsettled titles and involved all transactions in insecurity. This sanctified the ambition of Charles V with the halo of religion. This was the motive which underlay the suicidal policy of Philip II, leading to the endless wars with the Netherlands, to the rebellion of Granada, and to the wasteful support of the League. This was at the bottom of the Morisco disaffection, culminating in the expulsion of 1610 just after Philip III had practically accepted the loss of Holland by the truce of 1609. The land was robbed of its most industrious classes. It was drained of its bravest soldiers. Its trade and productiveness were fatally crippled, and it was reduced to the lowest term of financial exhaustion, all for the greater glory of God and in the belief that it was avenging offences to God. To meet the exigencies arising from this, and from the thoughtless extravagance of the monarchs, the labor on which rested the resources of the state was crushed to earth and subjected to burdens that defeated their own ends, for they drove the producer in despair from the soil. Productive industry and commerce, enfeebled by the expulsions, were so handicapped that they dwindled almost to extinction, and passed virtually into the hands of foreigners, who dealt under the mask of testa ferius, of Spaniards who lent their names to the real principles, for the most part the very heroics whom Spain had exhausted herself to destroy. Trade and credit were hampered, not only through the vitation of the currency, but through the ever-impending risk of sequestration and confiscation and the impediments of the censorship as developed in the vitus de navios. The blindness and inefficiency of the government intensified in every way the evils created by its mistaken policy, but at the roots of all lay the prolonged and relentless determination to enforce conformity at a time when the industrial and commercial era were opening, which was to bring wealth and power to the nations wise enough and liberal enough to avail themselves of its opportunities opportunities which Spain was invited virtually to monopolize through its control of the trade of the Indies and the production of the precious metals. There is melancholy truth in the boast of Dr. Pedro Peralta Barnavo in his relation 
of the Lima Auto of 1733 that the determination to enforce unity of faith at all costs had rendered Spain rather a church than a monarchy and her kings protectors of the faith rather than sovereigns. She was a temple in which the altars were cities and the oblations were men and she despised the prosperity of the state in comparison with the devotion to religion isabella and her hapsburg descendants were but obeying the dictates of conscience and executing the laws of the church when they sought to suppress hearsay and apose by force and they might well deem it both duty and good policy at a time when it was universally taught that unity of faith was the surest guarantee of the happiness and prosperity of nations spain with accustomed thorough thoroughness carried out this theory for the three centuries to a ridicule ad abertum through the inquisition organized armed and equipped to the last point of possible perfection for its work the elaborate arguments of the lanced defender only show that it cannot be defended without also defending the whole policy of the house of Habsburg, which wrought such misery and de degradation it was the essential part of a system and as such it contributed its full share to the ruin of spain that occasionally even an inquestor could have a glimmer of the truth appears from a very remarkable memorial addressed to philip the fourth by a member of the suprema with regard to the portuguese jews he states that they consider the rigor of the inquisition as a blessing since it drives them from spain to other lands where they can enjoy their religion and acquire prosperity he wishes to prevent this exodus which is depriving spain of population and wealth and exposing it to peril and to win back those who have expatriated themselves to which end he proposes greatly to soften inquestorial severity in regard to confiscation imprisonment and the wearing of the san benito except in the case of hardened in penitence he would welcome them back and even if their catholicism were merely external he argues that their children would become good catholics even as has proved to be the case with the descendants of the castilian jews indeed he goes so far as to urge that foreigners in general should be encouraged to bring their capital to spain to settle and be naturalized to marry spanish wives and thus minister to the wealth and prosperity of the land the worldly wisdom of this was too pungent to the prejudices of the time which clamoured as we have seen for extermination and isolation and its sagacious counsels were unheeded the judaizers were driven forth to aid in building up holland with their wealth and intelligence and spain in ever deepening poverty continued to cherish the ideals which she had embodied in the inquisition there was one service that the performance of which it was never tired of claiming for itself and it still claimed for it by its advocates that is the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries it preserved spain from the religious wars which desolated france and germany this service may well be called in question for the temperament and training of the spanish nation render ludicrous the assumption that a couple of hundred heretics among whom but half a dozen had the spirit of martyrdom for their faith could cause such a spread of dissidence as to endanger peace yet even should we admit this service its method 
in causing intellectual torpor and segregating the nation from all influences from abroad only postponed the inevitable while intensifying the disturbance when the change should come from medievalism to modernism the nineteenth century bore in an aggravated form the brunt which should have fallen on the sixteenth when the spirit of the revolution broke in it found a population sedulously trained to passive obedience to the state and submissiveness to the church it had been so long taught by theocratic absolution that it must not think or reason for itself that it had lost the power of reasoning on the great problems of life it was without reverence for law for it was accustomed to see the arbitrary will of an absolute sovereign override the law and it was without experience to choose between the sober realities of responsible government and the glittering promises of ardent idealists yet the revolution passed away leaving matters as they were before the habit of unquestioning submission inherited through generations has become so fixed a part of the national character that as we are told the people fail to recognize that they are as completely under bondage to cacchism as ernst while they were to monarchy that in fact the nation is still in its infancy and is unfit to govern itself as in temporal so it has been in this spiritual field in the turmoil of the revolution the inquisition died a natural death but the church filled the vacancy it had grown so accustomed to the acceptance on all hands of its divine mission it had so long enjoyed unassailable wealth and power that it could not adapt itself to the necessities of the new situation and when it could not rely upon the brute force of the state it called into play the popular passions which it had fostered as an irreconcilable it provoked the attacks made on its overgrown wealth and numbers it was uncompromising and would listen to no adjustment for it claimed the full benefit of the canon law under which it was exempted from all interference by the state its attitude was of immovable hostility to the new order of things and it suffered the rough handling that inevitably resulted courting martyrdom rather than tamely to permit profane hands to be laid upon the ark it has thus continued to be an unassemiable element in the political situation its policy directed from rome and the vast influence of its perfect organization employed to retard rather than to stimulate progress in good government and material prosperity what may be the outcome of the pending struggle between church and state aroused by the recognition of civil marriage it is too early to predict end of section ninety one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 92 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by henry charles lee book number nine chapter seven part eight conclusion retrospect thus the conclusion that may be drawn from our review of the causes underlying the misfortunes of spain 
is that what may fairly be attributable to the Inquisition is its service as the official instrument of the intolerance that led to such grave results, and its influence on the Spanish character in intensifying that intolerance into a national characteristic, while benumbing the Spanish intellect until it may be said for a time to have almost ceased to think. The objects for which it was so shrewdly and so carefully organized were effectively attained, and, in the eyes of experienced statesmen, at the time of its fullest development, it was the bulwark of the faith. In 1573, Leonardo Donato reflects the prevailing view in governmental circles when he speaks of its authority and severity as absolutely necessary, for the number of the new Christians was everywhere so great. Recently baptized with God knows what disposition, and with ancestral memories still vivid, that, if it were not for the incessant watch kept over them by the Inquisition, there would be great danger that Spain would lose her religion. In 1581, Gioan Francisco Morosini declares that although the Spaniards were in appearance the most devout and Catholic of nations, yet what between the Jews, Moriscos, and heretics, Spain would be more infected than Germany or England, if it were not for the fear inspired by the severity of the Inquisition. And the same views are expressed by Giam Battista Confalonierti in fifteen ninety one, and by Lucis Envoy da Namio Bernardini in sixteen o two. Yet the faith, thus seducedly prepared at such fearful cost, was largely, as we have seen, one of exterior observance without corresponding internal piety, ready to burst into flame for the maintenance of a dogma like the Immaculate Conception, and to earn heaven by paying for masses and anniversaries and chaplaincies, but not to labor for it by purity of life and self-abnegation, or by obeying the divine command to earn its bread by the sweat of its brow. The natural result of this, when brought face to face with modern conditions, is that Casanova's de Castillo, in a debate in the Cortes of 1869, declared with sorrow that Spain, of all nations, was the one most indifferent to religion, and a recent author asserts that there would be no hazard in affirming the Spaniards to be the most irreligious, indifferent, and practically atheist people in Europe. In fact, the disassociation of religion from morals, the incongruous connection of ardent zeal for dogma with laxity of life, was stimulated by the Inquisition. As we have seen, it paid no attention to morals, and thus taught the lesson that they were unimportant in comparison with accuracy of belief. No matter how dissolute was the conduct of the confessor with his spiritual daughters, he was safe as long as he did not commit a technical transgression, inferring suspicion of misbelief as to the sacrament, and even when he neglected these precautions, we have seen how benignant was the treatment extended to him. It is true that towards the end of the sixteenth century the inquisition showed remarkable ardor in prosecuting those who gave utterance to the common opinion that there was no sin in simple fornication between the unmarried and that in large measure it suppressed the utterance but as it punished only the utterance and not the sin did this did nothing to advance morality 
the same may be said of its ignorant destruction of works of art which it regarded as innocent and the occasional prohibition of a book or play that evoked its disapprobation in the absence of more serious work a few cases may be found of its undertaking to vindicate morals but they are too rare for us to attribute to them any motive save a desire to intermeddle the advancement of morality in fact was no part of its functions as a bulwark of the faith rather indeed it aided in disseminating corruption by its custom of reading at the autos de sentences con meridos of which the details were an effective popular education in vice the result is seen in the seventeenth century when the only heretics were the scattered and persecuted portuguese and yet there has probably never existed a society more abandoned to corruption so abandoned indeed that even the sense of shame was lost padre corella was no rigorist but towards the close of the century he draws a hideous picture of social conditions everywhere he says is vice and crime lust and cruelty fraud and rapine in the seats of trade in the halls of justice in the family in the court in the churches while the clergy if possible are worse than the laity philip the fourth who was so religiously supported the inquisition was not only notorious for his licentiousness but amused himself with scandalously sacrilegious comedies and farces in his palace theatre where the scenes and persons of scripture were made subjects of ridicule and this style passed into popular literature and rhymes which escaped the censure spanish theology which was supreme in the sixteenth and early seventeenth centuries made only one real contribution the invention of probabilism by bartholomew de menda in his commentaries on quinus in fifteen seventy seven on this was founded the new science of moral theology devoted to evading the penalties of sin and to applying to the decrees of god the favorite spanish device for eluding those of the king by obeying and not executing escobar held up to an infamous immortality by pascal merely compiled what he found in theologicans of the highest authority and when the laxity of the jesuit moyes opusium called forth a papal prohibition in sixteen sixty six repeated in sixteen eighty the spanish inquisition assorted its independence by refusing to put the work on the index the practical influence of all this is described in a memorial of nine spanish bishops in seventeen seventeen to clement the eleventh against the consulus morales of the capuan martin de torricella in which they state that probabilism had undermined immortality and all obedience to divine municipal and canon law and that multitudes live disorderly lives under appeal to probabilistic causatry for so-called probable opinions could be had to justify whatever men desire to do if the power of the inquisition thus was withheld when it might have been exerted with benefit to society it was actively employed under the latter hapsburgs to loosen the bonds of societal order and to stimulate contempt for law to it was largely attributable the virtual anarchy of spain during the seventeenth century arising from the numerous competing jurisdictions and the contempt 
felt for the royal officials. This found its origin in the insolent audacity for which the Inquisition enforced its claims to jurisdiction. When the royal officials were excommunicated, arrested, and imprisoned without scruple, and the highest courts were treated with contempt and contumely, respect for law and its ministers was fatally weakened. That the other privileged jurisdictions, the cruzada, the spiritual, and the military, should follow the example was inevitable, and the social condition of Spain became deplorable. In 1677 the Council of Castile represented to Carlos II the evils thus inflicted on the people by the two chief offenders, the Inquisition and the Cruzada, the most oppressive form of which was the abuse of excommunication for matters purely secular. The Council had endeavored to remedy this, but its authority had been suspended and it was powerless to protect the vassals of the crown. The Carlos feebly replied that, although he could deprive them of the royal jurisdiction which they abused, yet he deemed it better not to do so, and he contended himself with prohibiting the use of censures in temporal matters, a prohibition which, of course, was disregarded. In the very next year Carlos was made to feel his powerlessness in the face of the arrogant superiority asserted by the Inquisition. When in 1678 the raid on the whole trading community of Majora gave promise of immense confiscations, Carlos prudently ordered, May 30th, the viceroy to look after the safety of the sequestrations. The viceroy thereupon asked for inventories or statements and, on their refusal, made threats of taking further measures. The tribunal reported to the Suprema, which instructed the inquisitioners to defend their jurisdiction by censure and, if necessary, by exisatio ad divinis, when, if this did not suffice, they were to entrust their prisoners to the bishop and sail for Spain, reporting to the Pope. After dispatching this defiant and revolutionary missive, the Suprema, on August 8th, condescended to inform the king of it in the form of a stinging reboot. The request of the viceroy, it said, was an un exampled assault on religion and the holy see and also a profanation of the most venerable sacredness of the inquisition sequestered property was ecclesiastical property until confiscated and to allow a layman to control it would be subversive of all law as well as a violation of the secrecy of the inquisition Carlos humbly apologized. He had not meant to show distrust and would punish the viceroy if he had exceeded his instructions, but he complained that, without notice to him, the inquisitioners should have been ordered to leave Majora, and thus cause irreparable evils. The Suprema, in reply, followed up its advantage. The abandonment of Majora by the inquisitors would be a less evil than violating the secrecy of the inquisition. The viceroy should have positive orders to keep his hands off, and the king ought to have consulted it before issuing such instructions. This would have prevented all trouble, for the operations of the Inquisition were so special and peculiar that even his superior intelligence could not understand them without explanations. This insolence accomplished its purpose. Carlos was effectively snubbed, and we have seen how small was the share of the spoils eventually doled out to him. The Inquisition, in fact, 
was virtually an independent power in the state which asserted itself after the vigorous personality of ferdinand had been forgotten its aspiration to dominate the land was revealed in the projected order of santa maria de espada blanca which philip the second was shrewd enough to crush while yet there was time but the measure of independence which it had already attained was seen when the cortes of the kingdoms of aragon sought to get the signature of the inquisitor-general as well as the king to the concessions which they secured and when the inquisition ignored the royal agreements even to the point of deliberately contravening them in the matter of confiscations it was manifested in the affair of antonio perez when philip the second was obliged to call it to his assistance and it followed his own intervals in distrust of the royal policy so in the long struggle with bilbo over the vista navios it virtually set at defiance both the crown and all the authorities of biscay if it helped the monarchy in the struggle with rome over the regalias when it had thus secured its independence of the papal inquisition it had no scruple in turning its powers of censorship against the royal prerogative but for the advent of the bourbon dynasty it might reasonably have looked forward to becoming eventually dominant for it combined legislative and executive functions temporal and spiritual jurisdiction and asserted like the church the right to define the limits of its own powers its whole career indeed shows how baseless is the modern theory that it was an instrument of the state in establishing the autocracy of the monarch if the fallacy of this requires further proof it is sufficiently demonstrated even under the first of the bourbons by the fate of Macans, whom it dismissed from power and condemned to life of poverty and exile because in the service of the king he endeavored to render it what rank and gams fancy it to have been it is true that in its period of decadence it joined forces with the crown to withstand the inroad of free thought which was equally threatening to both and that it employed its expiring power to suppress political as well as spiritual hearsay but in this it was fighting its own battle as much as that of the monarchy on which it depended for existence End of section 92. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 93 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 2, Part 9, Conclusion. Retrospect. Defenders of the Inquisition in the controversy over its suppression and since then have relied largely on the assertion that during its existence no voice was raised against it that all organs of public opinion and all writers praised it as the protector of religion and as extremely careful to administer exact justice so far from this being the case we have seen its own admissions volume one page five thirty eight of the hearty hatred felt 
for it and its officials, and we have heard the complaints of the Cortes of Valladolid in 1518 and 1523, of Coruna in 1520, and of Madrid in 1575, besides the ceaselessness struggles of Aragon and Catalonia, whose Cortes had not been reduced to servility. What was its reputation throughout Europe may be gauged by the fact that, in 1535, when Jao III was endeavoring to have an inquisition of his own in Portugal, and there was talk of referring the subject to the general council, then expected shortly to assemble, his ambassador at Rome, Martin Ho, Archbishop of Funchal, warned him that if the matter was broached in the council it would result in abolishing the inquisition of spain in spain its reputation is to be gathered from the unbiased reports of the venetian envoys who lauded its services in the suppression of hearsay and to whom as practical statesmen it was an object of wonder and admiration as a machine perfectly devised to keep the people in abject subjection. In these reports it is observable that, while all are emphatic to its rigor, not one hazards approval of its justice. The envoys were profoundly impressed by the universal awe which it inspired. As early as 1525, Gasparo Contenari tells us that every one trembled before it, for its severity and the dread entertained for it were greater even than for the Council of Ten. In 1557, Federico Baduro speaks of the terror caused by its pitiless procedure. In 1563, Paolo Tipilo, after dwelling on the secrecy and unsparing rigor of its judgments, says that every one shudders at its very name, and as it has supreme authority over the property, life, honor, and even the souls of men. Two years later, Giovanni Soranzo speaks of the great fear inspired by it, for its authority transcends incomparably that of the king. In 1567, Antonio Tipolo echoes these assertions, and all agree in their comments on the influence of the mysterious secrecy of its operation and the relentless severity of its action. It scarce needs this testimony to explain why no unfavorable opinion of the Inquisition is to be expected of Spaniards during its existence, except by those who spoke as mandatories of the people in the Cortes or high officials in contests over compensias. Terror rendered silence imperative, and secrecy made ignorance universal. The discharged prisoner was sworn to reveal nothing of what he had endured, and any complaint of injustice subjected him to prosecution. Criticism was held to be impeding its action, and was a crime subject to condign punishment. Writers had ever to keep in view its censorship, with the certainty that any ill-judged word would ensure the suppression of a book and any attempt at self-justification would lead to worse consequences, as Bellando found when a petition to be heard cost him lifelong imprisonment and prohibition to use the pen. When, in the early Edict of Faith, every one was required under pain of excommunication to denounce any impeding, direct or indirect, of the tribunal, or any criticism of the justice of its operation, restraint became universal and habitual, and, in the instinct of self-preservation, men would naturally seek to teach themselves and their children 
not even to think ill of the inquisition lest in some unguarded moment a chance utterance might lead to prosecutions and infamy the popular refrain con el roy y la inquisition chiton silence as to the king and the inquisition reveals to us better than a world of argument the result of this repression through generations and its efficiency is seen in the fact that in toledo from sixteen forty eight to seventeen ninety four there was but a single trial for speaking ill of the holy office such training bore its fruits when autocracy broke down under revolution and the experiment of self-government was essayed the spaniard was taught not alone to repress his opinions as to the inquisition but to keep a guard on his tongue under all circumstances not only in public but in the sacred confidence of his own family for the duty of denunciation applied to husband and father to wife and children early as fifteen thirty four the orthodox juan louis Vives complained to erethemus that in those difficult times it was dangerous either to speak or to keep silent the cautious mariana tells us that the most grievous opposition caused by the introduction of the inquisition was the deprivation of freedom of speech which some persons regarded as a servitude worse than death we have seen how seriously were treated even the most trivial and careless expressions which could be tortured into disregard of some theological tenet or disrespect for some church observance and it behooved every one to be on his guard at all times and in all places the yearly edict of faith kept the terror of the inquisition constantly before every man and was perhaps the most efficient device ever invented to subject a population to the fear of an ever impending danger no other nation ever lived through centuries under a moral oppression so complete so minute and so all-pervading that the inquisition inspired a dread greater than felt for the royal authority is illustrated by a curious instance in which it was utilized for good in subduing a lawless community in fifteen eighty eight lupus martin de govilla inquisitor of barcelona in a visitation came to mont blanc where no inquisitor had been for many years he found it a populous town torn by fractions so bitter that men were slain in the streets battles were fought in the plaza and women at their windows were shot with arabesses after publishing the edict of faith he discovered that witnesses were afraid to come to him through the streets and regarding this as a contempt of the inquisition he issued a proclamation forbidding the carrying of arabesses and crossbows and his order was obeyed he made an example of one offender by requiring him to hear mass as a penitent banishing him and confiscating his arabus which quieted the people so that the inquisition could be carried on then a murder occurred, and the riddlers procured from the viceroy full powers for him to pacify the town. By general agreement all placed themselves under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition, as there was no safety under the royal, and they gave thanks to God that peace was restored, and that men could move around without arms. Godvilla went to Poblet when news was brought him of another murder. He returned and imprisoned and penanced those guilty who complained to the viceroy, but the audiencia, after examination, dismissed the complaint 
and this strange jurisdiction of the Inquisition seems to have continued for some ten years. Before dismissing the impression produced by the severity of the Inquisition, it will not be amiss to attempt some conjure as to the totality of its operations, especially as regards the burnings which naturally affected more profoundly the imagination. There is no question that the number of these has been greatly exaggerated in popular belief, an exaggeration to which Laurenti has largely contributed by his absurd method of computation on an arbitrary assumption of a certain annual average for each tribunal in successive periods. It is impossible now to reconstruct the statistics of the Inquisition, especially during its early activity, but some general conclusions can be formed from the details accessible as to a few tribunals. The burnings without doubt were numerous during the first few years, through the unregulated ardor of inquisitors little versed in the canon law who seemed to have condemned right and left on flimsy evidence and without allowing their victims the benefit of applying for reconciliation for while there might be numerous negativos there certainly were few pertinacious impediments the discretion allowed to them to judge as to the genuineness of conversation gave a dangerous power which was doubtless abused by zealots and the principle that imperfect confession was conclusive of impedience added many to the list of victims while the wholesale reconciliations under the edicts of grace afforded an abundant harvest to be garnered under the rule condemning relapse in the early years moreover the absent and the dead contributed with their effigies largely to the terrible solemnities of the quemadro modern writers vary irreconcilably in their estimates influenced more largely by subjective considerations than by the imperfect statistics at their command. Rogero coolly asserts as a positive fact that those who perished in Spain at the stake for hearsay did not amount to four hundred, and that these were voluntary victims, who refused to retract their errors. Father Gams reckons two thousand for the period up to the death of Isabella in 1504, and as many more from that date up to 1758. On the other hand, Lorente calculates that, up to the end of Torquemada's activity, there had been condemned 105,294 persons, of whom eight thousand eight hundred were burnt alive six thousand five hundred in effigy and ninety thousand and four exposed to public penance while up to one thousand five hundred and twenty four the grand totals amounted to fourteen thousand three hundred and forty four nine thousand three hundred and seventy two and one hundred and ninety five thousand nine hundred and thirty seven even these figures are exceeded by Amor de la Rio, who is not usually given to exaggeration. He assumes that, up to 1525, when the Moriscos commenced to suffer as heretics, the number of those burnt alive amounted to 28,540, of those burnt in effigy to 16,520, and those penanced to 303,847, making a total of 348,907 condemnations for Judaism. Don Meligres Martin, whose familiarity with the documents is incontestable, tells us that in Castile, during 1481, more than 20,000 were reconciled 
under the edicts of grace more than three thousand were penanced with the san benito and more than four thousand were burnt but he adduces no authorities in support of the estimate end of section ninety three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section number 94 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Nine, Chapter Two, Part Ten, Conclusion, Retrospect. The only contemporary who gives us figures for the whole of Spain is Hernando de Pulgar, secretary of Queen Isabella. His official position gave him facilities for obtaining information, and he scarcely veiled dislike for the Inquisition was not likely to lead to underrating its activity. He states at 15,000 those who had come in under edicts of grace, and at 2,000 those who were burnt, besides the dead whose bones were exhumed in great quantities. The number of penitents he does not estimate. Unluckily, he gives no date, but as his chronicle ends in 1490, we may assume that to be the term comprised. With some variations, his figures were adapted from subsequent writers. Bernaldez only makes the general statement that throughout Spain indefinite number were burnt and condemned and reconciled and imprisoned, and of those reconciled many relapsed and were burnt. Imperfect as are the records, we may endeavor to test these various estimates by such evidence as is at hand respecting a few of the tribunals. In this we may commence with Seville, which was unquestionably the most active. The Inquisition had started there as the center of crypto judaism as it was the most populous city of castile with nearly half a million inhabitants and its unrivaled commercial activity rendered it peculiarly attractive to the conversos while isabella's andalusian degree of expulsion must have largely increased the number of pseudo proselytes in 1524 there was placed over the gateway of the castle of Trinia, occupied by the tribunal, an inscription of which the purpose is not entirely clear, but significantly that up to that time it had caused the abjuration of more than 20,000 heretics and had burnt nearly 1,000 obstinate ones. This is probably an understatement if we are to believe Bernandez, who asserts that in eight years from the founding of the Seville Tribunal up to 1488, it had burnt in person more than 700 heretics, besides many effigies of fugitives and an infinite number of bones. Those reconciled during the same period he estimates at 5,000 still its activity must soon have greatly diminished for in fifteen o two antoine de la lange visiting the castle of triana describes it as containing more than twenty heretic prisoners which he evidently regards as a large number but which would argue a very moderate amount of persecution in view of the leisurely procedure that was becoming usual. There is therefore an apparent tendency to exaggerate the achievements of the Holy Office in the statement of its secretary, Zurita, some half-century or more later, that in Seville alone 
up to the year 1520 there were more than 4,000 culprits burned and more than 30,000 reconciled and penanced, besides the numerous fugitives, and he adds that an author very diligent in the matter affirms these figures to be exceedingly defective, and that, in the archbishopry of Seville alone, there were condemned as Judaizing heretics more than a hundred thousand persons, including those reconciled. Cardinal Contarini, when Venetian envoy in 1525, was evidently misled by this tendency to amplification when he describes the Inquisition as having made a slaughter of the new Christians impossible to exaggerate. Unfortunately, no authentic records have seen the light by which to test the accuracy of these varying estimates of the activity of the most destructive tribunal during the early period. It is otherwise with several of those that rank next to it in importance. For the province of Toledo, as we have seen, the first tribunal was established at Citadud Real, where its two years of existence it relaxed in person 47 and effigy 98. Transferred to Toledo in 1485, its operations at first were energetic, but they diminished greatly towards the end of the century until, in 1501, it had a spasmodic period of activity through the discovery of La Moca de Herrera, Volume 1, page 186, a young Jewish prophetess to whose numerous believers no mercy was shown, for those who had been reconciled thus incurred the penalty of relapse. The total operations of the Toledo Tribunal, from its origin in 1485 until 1501, amount to 250 relaxed in person, over 500 in effigy, about 200 imprisoned, and 5,200 reconciled under edicts of grace. Of the personally relaxed, nearly half, or 117, were followers of the prophetess, leaving only 139 ordinary Judaizers, and, of those imprisoned, about 140 may be accounted for in the same way. Sarah Gossa was reckoned as one of the most deadly tribunals in Spain. Indeed, Lorente remarks that if he had taken it and Toledo as the basis of his calculations, he would have tripled the number of victims. For this we have the details of the sixty-five autos held from 1485 to 1502, furnished by the record printed in the appendix to Volume 1. Summarized, this gives the totals of 119 burnt alive, five quartered, beheaded, or strangled prior to burning, three bodies burnt, 29 effigies burnt, and 458 penanced, or an aggregate of 614. The Libro Verde de Aragon, moreover, gives us an official list of the residents of Saragossa, burnt from 1483 to 1574, in summarizing which it appears that, during these ninety-two years, the total of relaxations in person was 125 and in effigy 77, including seven witches, three sorcerers, and four Protestants. Tabulation by years emphasizes the demutation of activity after the close of the 15th century. Barcelona is another important tribunal of which we have accurate statistics during its yearly years, furnished by the royal archivist Pierre Miguel Carbonel. From its foundation to the end of Torquemada's career in 1496, there were 31 autos celebrated in Barcelona, Tarragona, Laridia, Girona, Perpigan, Vich, Elm, and Balaguer, 
in these the totals are only ten strangled and burnt thirteen burnt alive fifteen dead and four hundred and thirty burnt in effigy one reconciled in effigy one hundred and sixteen penanced with prison and three hundred and four reconciled for spontaneous confession valencia of all the tribunals was the one which best maintained its activity throughout the sixteenth century owing to the dense morisco population we have a list of all persons imprisoned for hearsay from the beginning in fourteen eighty five up to fifteen ninety two inclusive amounting in all to three thousand one hundred and four of whom five hundred and thirty were contributed by the last four years fifteen eighty nine to ninety two when the persecution of the moriscos was particularly active there is also an alphabetical list of persons relaxed from the beginning until fifteen ninety three unfortunately imperfect and ending with the letter n but by adding twenty five per cent we can obtain a reasonably close approximation to the total the list as we have it gives five hundred and fifteen relaxations in person and three hundred and eighty three in effigy or with the addition of twenty five per cent six hundred and forty three of the former and four hundred and seventy nine of the latter being nearly an average of six per annum of the former and four and a half of the latter Valladoid had the most extensive territory of all the tribunals but it comprised the northern provinces where the new christians were comparatively few it was not organized for work until fourteen eighty eight making its first arrest on september twenty ninth of that year and holding its first auto on june nineteenth fourteen eighty nine when after nine months work on new ground there were but eighteen relaxations in person and four in effigy the next auto recorded did not occur until january fifth fourteen ninety two when the relaxations in person numbered thirty two and in effigy two this while sufficiently cruel indicates that the victims in the northern provinces bore but a small proportion to those in the southern at the other extremity of spain was the little tribunal of majora which acquired a sudden and sinister reputation by the occurrences of sixteen seventy eight and sixteen ninety one it started in fourteen eighty eight and for some years was fairly active lapsing in time into virtual topor as far as persecution was concerned so that including its autos of sixteen seventy eight and sixteen ninety one the whole aggregate of its work for over two centuries amounted to one hundred and thirty nine relaxations in person four hundred and eighty two in effigy and six hundred and thirty seven reconciliations in addition to three hundred and thirty eight reconciled under edicts of grace in fourteen eighty eight and fourteen ninety one in the latter periods there are records which enable us to reach a fairly accurate computation of the activity of some at least of the tribunals a few of these i have had the opportunity of consulting and the researches of future students will doubtless in time compile tolerably complete statistics for the second and third centuries of the inquisition after the suprema had compelled the tribunals to render periodical reports we have those of toledo from fifteen seventy five to sixteen ten not wholly complete for the auto of fifteen ninety five is omitted and the m s breaks off at the commencement of that of sixteen ten toledo at the time was the most important tribunal in spain for it included madrid yet during these thirty-five years the relaxations amount to only eleven in person and fifteen in effigy so that 
allowing for the omissions, there may have been one in person every three years, and one in effigy every two years, while the various penances number in all nine hundred and four. Small as are these results, they continued to diminish. For the same tribunal we have a record extending from 1648 to 1794, and, during this century and a half, there were only eight relaxations in person and sixty-three in effigy, the latest execution occurring in 1738. This gives us an average of one of the former every eighteen years, and one of the latter every two years and a quarter. In addition, there were a thousand and ninety-four penanced in various ways. It is true that, about 1650, a separate tribunal was erected in Madrid, but a list of relaxations there, from its foundation up to 1754, when relaxation had virtually become obsolete, gives us only an aggregate of nineteen in person and sixteen in effigy, or one in every five years of the former and in six years of the latter. During the height of the renewed persecution of Judaizers in the eighteenth century, in the whole of the sixty-four autos celebrated throughout Spain from 1721 to 1727, the total number of relaxations was 77 in person and 74 in effigy, making an average of about 11 a year of each class. A grim record enough, but vastly less than has been popularly accepted. Nor must it be forgotten that, in the vast majority of cases, the victim was mercifully strangled before the fire was set. We have seen how very small was the proportion of impediments who preserved to the last and refused to earn the garrote by professing conversion. End of section 94. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 95 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 2, Part 11, Conclusion, Retrospect The material at hand as yet is evidently insufficient to justify even a guess at the ghastly total. Yet, after all, it is not a matter of as much moment as seems to have been imagined to determine how many human beings the Inquisition consigned to the stake, how many bones it exhumed, how many effigies it burnt, how many penitents it threw into prison or sent to the galleys, how many orphans its confiscations cast penniless on the world. The story is terrible enough without reducing it to figures. Its awful significance lies in the fact that men were found who, conscientiously did this to the utmost of their ability in this name of the gospel of peace and of him who came to teach the brotherhood of man it is enough to know that the inquisitors used their utmost efforts to stamp out what they deemed hearsay and the tale of their victims is not the gauge of their cruelty but of the number of heretics whom they could discover, save when pride or stupidity or ambition may have been the impelling motive. The men are not to be blamed, but the teaching which gave them such a conception of duty so relentlessly performed, and framed a system of procedure which shrouded their acts in darkness, 
and deprived the accused of his legitimate means of defense. The good cura de la Palestio was evidently a kindly-natured man, but he declares that the fires lighted by the Inquisition shall burn to the very heart of the wood until all judaizers are slain and not one remains, even to their children if infected with the same leprosy. In the hurried work of the early period there was no effort made to induce the conversation that would save the accused from the stake, but in later times the persistent labor bestowed on the condemned during the three days prior to the auto is evidence that the tribunals did not act through thirst of blood and that they were sincerely desirous to save both the body and soul of the heretic in the same spirit that torture was sometimes piteously administered in order to confirm the sufferer in the faith still at times there was doubtless a certain pride in affording to the populace the spectacle of a relaxation and thus demonstrating the authority of the holy office that the public should relish the entertainment thus provided was natural both from the inherent attraction which the sight of suffering has for a certain class of minds and from the assiduous teaching that hearsay was to be exterminated and that slaying of a heretic was acceptable offering to god the inquisitor lorenzo flores relates that at the great validoid auto of 1609 where there were seventy penants many of them reconciled or sentenced to abjuration de vehementi the people murmured because one condemned to relaxation had professed conversion in time and had thus escaped the stake and they were many complaints that the auto was not worth the expense of coming to see he adds that at toledo where there was no one relaxed the people declared that the auto was a failure there is something terrible in the fierce exultation which fanaticism experienced in the agonies of the misbeliever padre garo in his account of the maloquin auto of may sixth sixteen ninety one gloats with an exuberance which he knew would be shared by his readers on the agonies of the three impediments who were burnt alive as the flames reached them they struggled desperately to free themselves from the iron ring which clasped them to the stake rafael benito terongi succeeded in releasing himself but to no purpose for he fell sideways into the fire his sister kathleena who had boasted that she would cast herself into the flames when they began to lick her, shrieked to be set free. Raphael Valls, who had professed stolical insensibility, stood motionless as a statue so long as only the smoke reached him, but when the flames attacked him he bent and twisted and wreathed till he could no more. He was as fat as a suckling pig and burnt internally, so that, after the flames left him, he continued burning like a hot coil, and bursting open, his entrails fell out like those of Judas. Thus burning alive, they died to burn forever in hell. Such were the lessons which the church inculcated, and such was the training which it gave to Spain. So that the auto de came to be regarded as a spectacular religious entertainment on the occasion of a royal visit or in honor of the marriage of princes incidental to this was the cruel per perpetuation of ancestral disgrace by the display of san benitos in churches which philip the second rightly reckoned as the severest of inflictions it intensified the terror inspired by the tribunal which with a word can consign a whole lineage to infamy it kept alive and vigorous the horror of hearsay and was aggravated by the statutes of limpeza 
i hesitate to impunge the motives of those who were active in these terrible triumphs of faith as they were fondly termed and as stated above the efforts to induce conversion show that there was no absolute thirst of blood yet it is impossible in reviewing the career of the inquisition not to recognize how powerful an adjunct to fanaticism was the profitableness of persecution had the holy office been a source of expense instead of income we may reasonably doubt whether the ardor of ferdinand and isabella would have suffered for its introduction and it certainly would have had but a comparatively short and inactive career we have seen how closely ferdinand watched its expenditures and endeavored to keep down its cost while enjoying the results of its productiveness and how grudgingly the crown ministered to its necessities when aid was unavoidable we have seen moreover how eagerly the inquisition itself grasped at all sources of gain how it was stimulated to convict its victims by the prospect of their confiscations and how fines and penances were sealed not by the guilt of the culprits but by its necessities how jealously it guarded its receipts and how when it reeked of deception and mediacy when there was attempt to investigate its finances after all is said the inquisition was an institution with a double duty the destruction of hearsay and the raising of money to encompass that destruction and there are not wanting indications that the latter tended to supersede or at least to obscure the former we may well question the purity of zeal which provided punishments and disabilities for hearsay at the same time chaffered over the market price of commutations and dispensations through which those penalties could be evaded not only confiscation but pecuniary penance and fines were a source of revenue provocative of continual abuse and the rage for limpenza provided abundant opportunities for extortion the filthy order of gain pervades all the active period of the inquisition and its comparative inactivity during its latter career may perhaps be attributed as much to the absence of wealthy heretics as to the diminishing spirit of intolerance various ingenious theories have been framed to relieve the inquisition of responsibility for the remarkable eclipse of spanish intellectual progress after the sixteenth century it is one of the interesting problems in the history of literature that spain whose brilliant achievements throughout the reformation period promised to make her as dominant in the world of letters as in military and naval enterprise should within the space of a couple of generations have become the most uncultured land in christdom without a public to encourage learning and genius and without learning and genius to stimulate a public for this there must have been a cause and no other adequate one than the inquisition has been discovered to account for this oculation indeed but for the effort to argue it away it would seem superfluous to insist that a system of severe repression of thought by all the instrumentalities of inquisition and state is an ample explanation of the decadence of spanish learning and literature especially when coupled with the obstacles thrown around printing and publication by their combined censorship the tribulations of louis de leon and francisco sanchez illustrate the dangers to which independent thinkers were exposed the great printing house of which pontares was ruined by the extenches of the inquisition in the matter of the vatable bible all a priori considerations cast the responsibility on the censorship of thought whether printed or expressed verbally in 
what were known as propositions and burden of proof is thrown upon those who deny it their reliance is on the fact that isabella stimulated the development of spanish culture and at the same time established the inquisition which thus was in existence for more than a century before the decadence became marked this is quite easily explicable the inquisition was founded to extirpate jewish and moorish apostasy in this it long had ample work without developing its evil capacity in the direction of censorship save in such a sporadic instance as diego deza's prosecution in fifteen o four of the foremost scholar of his time elio antonio de nebridgia for venturing to correct the errors of the vulgate for the compulsion polygot in the service of zimes who protected him and when inquisitor-general allowed him to resume his labors with the advent of lutheranism there gradually commenced the search for errors crude indexes of condemned books were compiled reading and investigation became restricted the pragmatica of 1559 forbade education at foreign seats of learning and an elaborate system was gradually organized for protecting spain from intellectual intercourse with other lands while at home every phrase that could be construed in an objectionable sense was condemned for a while the men whose training had been free from those trammels persisted in spite of persecution more or less severe but they gradually died out and had no successors in 1601 mariana explained that he translated his history from the original latin because there were few who understood that language such learning brought neither honor nor profit and he feared the unskillfulness of those who threatened to undertake the task it is true however that latin was widely studied as essential to gaining place in church or state but to the neglect of everything else fray penalosa e montdragon in 1629 while boasting of the thirty-two universities and four thousand latin schools and of spanish preeminence in the supreme science of theology for which there were infinite rewards admits that there were none for the other sciences and arts which were not regarded with favor or estimated as formerly the intellectual energy of the nation diverted from more serious channels continued through another period to exhibit itself in the lighter fields of literature whose names of cervantes lope de vega tiroso de molina calderon de la brera covido de Villegas, and others show of what spanish intellect was still capable if it were allowed free play even those however passed away and had no successors in the growing intellectual torpedor created by obscurus censorship and a dreary blank followed which even the stimulation attempted by philip v could not relieve end of section ninety five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 96 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Nine, Chapter Two, Part Twelve, Conclusion, Retrospect. To produce and preserve this torpor, 
by repressing all dangerous intellectuality spain was carefully kept out of the current of european progress in other lands the debates of the reformation forced catholics as well as protestants to investigations and speculations shocking to spanish conservatism the human mind was enabled to cast off the shackles of the dark ages and was led to investigate the laws of nature and the relations of man to universe and to god from all this bustling intellectual movement spain was carefully secluded short-sighted opportunism seeking the turmoil which agitated france and england and germany might bless the institution which preserved the peninsula in peaceful stagnation but the price paid for torpidity was fearfully extravagant for spain became an intellectual nonity even the grand theologians and mystics disappeared from the field which they had made their own and were succeeded by a race of probabilistic causalists who sought only to promote and to justify self-indulgence how intellectual progress fared under these influences may be estimated by a single instance when in england halley was investigating the periodicity of the comet which bears his name in spain learned professors of the universities of salamanca and saragossa were publishing tracts to reassure the frightened people by proving that the dreadful portent boded evil only to the wicked to the turk and the heretic the perfect success of the inquisition in its work is manifested in the contrast between the eighteenth and the early sixteenth century as illustrated by the statement of juan antonio mayans e siscar that a cartload of the precious m s s bestowed by zemans on his university of alea was sold to the fireworks maker torricilia for a display in honor of philip v and that several other similar collections had shared the same fate even after half a century of bourbon effort to revitalize the dormant intellect of spain father rabgo the royal confessor grudged the money he spent on histographers and academics it was a pure gift he says for it yields no fruits in fact the awakening from intellectual stupor was slow for dom clemencine tells us that there was less printing in spain at the commencement of the nineteenth century than there had been in the fifteenth under isabella it is impossible not to conclude that the inquisition paralyzed both the intellectual and the economic development of spain and it is scarce reasonable for valera to complain that when spain was aroused from its mental marasmus it was to receive a foreign and not to revive a native culture the science of art and literature should thus be submerged was a national misfortune but even more to be deplored were the indirect consequences material progress became impossible industry languished and the inability to meet foreign competition assisted the mistaken internal policy of the government in prolonging intensifying the poverty of the people nor was this the chief of evils that sprung from keeping the mind of the nation in leading strings from repressing thought and from excluding foreign ideas for the people were thus rendered absolutely unfitted to meet the inevitable change that came with the revolution to this in large measure may be attributed the sufferings through which spain has passed in the transition from absolutism to modern conditions we have thus followed the career of the spanish inquisition from its foundation to its suppression we have examined its methods and its acts and have sought to appraise its influence and its share in the misfortunes which overwhelmed the nation the conclusion can scarce be avoided that its work was almost wholly evil and that 
through its reflex action the persecutors suffered along with the persecuted yet who can blame isabella or taquemada or the hapsburg princes for their share in originating and maintaining this disastrous instrument of wrong the church had taught for centuries that implicit acceptance of its dogmas and blind obedience to its commands were the only avenues to salvation that hearsay was treason to god its extermination the highest service to god and the highest duty to man this grew to be the universal belief and when protestant sects framed their several confessions each one was so supremely confident of possessing the secret of the divine being and his dealings with the creatures that all shared the zeal to serve god in the same cruel fashion the spanish inquisition was only a more perfect and more lasting institution than the others were able to fashion as regards witchcraft indeed a more humane and rational one for no one can appreciate the service which in this matter it rendered to spain who has not realized the horrors of the witchcraft trials in which catholic and protestant europe rivaled each other the spirit among all was the same and none are entitled to cast the first stone unless we accept the humble and despised moravian brethren and the disciples of george fox the faggots of miguel servet bear witness to the stern resolve of calvinism lutheranism has its roll call of victims anglicanism under edward the sixth in fifteen fifty undertook to organize an inquisition on the spanish pattern which burnt joan of kent for arianism and the writ de herito comberendo was not abolished until sixteen seventy six much as we may abhor and deplore this cruelty we must acquit the actors of moral responsibility for they but acted in the consciousness belief that they were serving the creator and his creatures the real responsibility can be traced to distant ages to st augustine and st leo the great and the fathers who deduced from the doctrine of exclusive salvation that the obstinate dissident is to be put to death not only in punishment for his sin but to save the faithful from infection this hideous teaching crystallized into a practical system came in the course of centuries to be an essential feature of the religion which it distorted so utterly from the love and charity inculcated from the founder to dispute it was a hearsay subjecting the disputant from the penalties of hearsay and not to enforce it was to misuse the powers of entrusted by god to rulers for the purpose of establishing his kingdom on earth in spain under peculiar conditions this resolve to enforce unity of belief in the conviction that it was essential to human happiness here and hereafter led to the framing of a system of so-called justice more inquitous than has been involved by the cruelest despotism which placed the lives the fortunes and the honor not only of individuals but of their posterity in the hands of those who could commit wrong without responsibility who tempted human fragility to indulge its passions and its greed without restraint and which subjected the population to a blind and unreasoning tyranny against which the slightest murmur of complaint was a crime the procedure which left the fate of the accused virtually in the hands of his judges was rendered doubly vicious by the invaluable secrecy in which it was enveloped a secrecy which invited justice by shielding its perpetrators and enabling them to make a parade of benignant righteousness it was the crowning iniquity 
of the Inquisition that it thus afforded to the evil-minded the amplest opportunity of wrongdoing. History affords no parallel to such a skillfully organized system, working relentlessly through centuries. The Inquisitors were men, not demons or angels, and when injustice and oppression were rife in the secular courts, it would be folly not to expect them in the impenetrable recesses of the holy office if we had occasioned met with instances of kindliness and genuine desire to do right we have incidentally encountered the opposite too often for us to doubt its frequency that the rulers of the inquisition recognized the danger of this and sought to diminish it by moral influences is evident from the admirable player of utterance of which by a carta accordia of april thirteenth sixteen hundred was ordered daily after mass at the opening of the morning session this implored the holy spirit to fill their hearts and guide their judgments so that they might not be mislaid by ignorance or favor or be corrupted by gifts or acceptance of persons that their decisions might be in unison with his will so that in the end they may earn eternal reward by well-doing yet we might feel more confidence in the sincerity of this attempt to curb by moral influence the evil tendencies fostered by the system if there had been stern repression and punishment of official wrongdoing instead of the habitual mercy which served as encouragement after all the great lesson taught by the history of the inquisition is that the attempt of man to control the conscience of his fellows reacts upon himself he may inflict misery but in due time that misery recoils on him or on his descendants and the full penalty is extracted with interest never has the attempt been made so thoroughly so continuously or with such means of success as in spain and never has the consequent retribution been so palatable and so severe the sins of the fathers have been visited on the children and the end is not yet a corollary to this is that the unity of faith which was the ideal statesman and churchman alike in the sixteenth century is fatal to the healthful spirit of competition through which progress moral and material is fostered improvement was impossible as long as the holy see held a monopoly of salvation and however deplorable were the hatred and strife developed by the rivalry which followed the reformation it yet was of inestimable benefit in raising the moral standards of both sides in breaking down the stubbornness of conservatism in rendering development possible terrible as were the wars of religion which followed the lutheran revolt yet were they better than the stagnation preserved in spain throughout efforts of the inquisition so long as human nature remains what it is so long as the average man requires stimulation from without as well as within so long as progress is the reward only of earnest endeavor we must recognize that rivalry is the condition precedent of advancement and that competition is good works in the most beneficent sphere of human activity end of section ninety six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 97 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by Henry Charles Lee. 
Appendices 1 and 9, Abjuration of Joseph Fernandez de Toro, Bishop of Oviedo, Prayer Recited Daily at Opening of Morning Session. Appendix 1, Abjuration of Joseph Fernandez de Toro, Bishop of Oviedo, Bellario de la Orden de Santiago, Libro 5, Folio 150, Ego Joseph Fernandez de Toro, Olim Episcopus Oertensis, Quorum Sanctissimo in Cristo Patre, et Domine Nostro Domine Clemente Divina, Providentia, Papa un decimo, Humiliter, Genuflexus Wobus Emissit, Armis Didi, Cardinalibus Contra Hereticam, Prawititem, generalibus inquisitoribus ei assistentibus sacrosancto dei evangelia coram me posita manibus tangens siens neminem salvum fieri posse extra elum fidem quam tenet credit profitur ac docit sancta catholica et apostolica romana ecclesia contra quam fatior et dolio mi gravitur erase quia tenui et docui respectue erroris et heresies formales ac domata contra veritatum eustem es ecclesiae et perecpue quia tenui et credidi quod non peccaverum nec peccare fessorum ex speciali providentia dei in quibistum octibus turbibus a me habitus cum faeminus quod concussionis et corporis tre mores cum pollutione sequata attribuendi essent operationi de monis idioque absque peccato essent quod actus exteriores plexuum asculorum aliarumque orum in honestarum essent supernaturalis in causa adioque adeo et a iesu procederent quod predicta oscula et amplexus essent immunes a motu libidinis et essent amotiva maxime humiliationis ex supposita uniena cum deo quod facta turpia cum femina complici procederent ex redundantia amoris urgia iesum adieque a parte inferiore procederent et ex motu ipsius iesu impellerentur quod stante supposita tam mea quam feminae clempisus unione cum deo posset et truesque status componi una simul cum extorioribus actibus pecaminosis amnesque impulsus quos in eandum feminam habebam dei et iesu essent impulsus quod pessima doctrina a me insinuata dei esset doctrina quod a deo habarem donum discretionis spirituum impulsus et illustrationis ad agnascendum spiritualem anime stratum ipsaque spirituum discretio ac doctrinarum cognito esset lux mihi a deo infusa essem super omnis illustratus idioque essem omnibus superior quod facta turpia a me habita cum femina complici esset exercitium et martyrium a deo missum ad utruusque humiliationum et purificationum quo deus gulando et amplectendo feminum complicum in me adesit iesu ipsique iesus immediante me ita agret et loque etur quod stante dicta supposita unione cum deo ab ipso mote essent potentiae mie memoria intellectus et volantis ipsique deus esset meus intellectus memoria volantis et spiritus idque esset idem ac tres distincte persene 
una majestas et unus deus et alias crediti propositionis et dogmata mihi in processu contestata quae quidem propositionis tanquam temerariae erroniae scandalosiae christianiae disciplinae relaxativae mala sonantes periculose pre sumptuose errori proxime abusive verborum sacre scripturae injurose in sanctos insane sacrilege heresim sapientis de heresy suspecte impiae blasphemae coincidentis cum propositionibus molinos et hereticae respectuae centurate et qualificate furorant nunc de practictis erebus et heresibus dolens certus de veritate fide catholicae corde sincere ac fide non fiete abjuro deteste maledico ana Thema tizo et respectuae retracto omnis supradictos eros et heresies quos et quas tenui et credidi et promito ad euro me nunc toto corde absque ula hesitatione crideri et in futurum firmiter crediturum quic quid tedit credit predicit profiditur ac docit edam s catholica ecclesia et abjuro detester maledico et anathetmetizo non solum supradictos errores et heresies verum tiam generalite omnem elium errorem dictae sancte ecclesiae contrarium omnem quae aliam heresim et promito et euro me neque corde neque woke neque scripto unquam recessarum quem cumque occasione sive praetextu a sancto fide catholica nec creditorum vel ad doctorum aliquem errorum item contrarum su aliquam heresim promito etiam me integre adem platurum omnes et singulus pene tentius mihi a sanctitate vestra impositas sive impanendas et si umquam eliqui ex dictis meis promissionibus et juramentis juramentis quod deus evertat contra venero me sub ixio omnibus penis a sacris cannabis a liisque constitionibus generalibus et particularibus contra who use modi delinquentis inflictus et promulgatus sic me deus ajuit et ilius sancta evangelia quae propius manibus tango ego joseph fernandez de tor superdictus abjurawi your rawi promisi et me ablagawi et ut supra et infidam veritatis presentum schedulum mei abjuritionis propria mea manu subscripsi eum quae recitia recitawi de verbo ad verbum rome in palatio quir rinali hac di a seventeen julii seventeen nineteen ego joseph fernandez de tor episcopus aburawi et supra manu propria appendix nine prayer recited daily at opening of morning session bibliotheca nationale session de manuscripto five hundred one hundred and twenty two folio one ad sumis domine sancte spiritus ad sumis quidem picate immanitate detenti sed in nomine tuo specialitur aggregati veni ad nos adesto nobis dignari ilabi cordibus nostris doce nos quid agamos quo gradimus ostende quid officeri 
debiamus ut te auxili ante tibi in omnibus placeri va liamus esto salus et suggester et effector judiciorum nostrorum qui solus cum deo patre et eius filio nomen possides gloriosum non nos patriaris perturbatoris esse justiciae qui summum diligis equitatum ut in sinistrum nos ignorantia non trahat non favor infectat non acceptio muneris vel personae corrompat sed jung j nos tibi efficacitur solius tu e grati e dono ut simus in te un um et in nullo de vi emus a vero qua tenus in nomine tuo collecti sic in cunctis tenem amus cum moderamini pictatus justitieque ut hic a te in nulle dissentiat sententia nostra ut in futuro pro bene gestus consequamur premia sempiterna amen end of section ninety seven Section number 98 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victor Villarraza. Appendix 2nd abstract of the case of catalina maffeo in fifteen ninety one relación de las causas despachadas en el auto de la fe que se celebró en la inquisición de toledo domingo de la santísima trinidad nueve días de junio mil quinientos noventa y un años Konig, universitat bibliotheque of hall y c twenty t I. See page twenty hundred and twenty four. Catalina Mateo, viuda, vecina del Cazar, de edad de cincuenta años, fue presa por el vicario de Alcalá con dieciséis testigos de que en la dicha villa, de cuatro años a esta parte, habían muerto cuatro o cinco criaturas de muertes violentas que era imposible haberlas hecho sino brujas y de que la dicha catalina mateo y olalla sobrina y joana izquierda eran tenidas por tales públicas y especialmente la dicha mateo hízole proceso y dióle tormento y en él la dicha catalina mateo dijo que era verdad que podría haber cuatro o cinco años que Olaya Sobrina la había dicho si quería ser bruja, ofreciéndole que el demonio tendría con ella acceso torpe y que era buen oficio, y que una noche por medio de la dicha Joana Izquierda la había llamado a su casa, a donde estando todas tres había entrado el demonio en figura de cabrón, y hablando aparte primero con las dichas Olaya y Joana, las había abrazado, y después a la dicha Mateo, porque ellas le habían dicho que también ella quería ser bruja, y que el dicho demonio le había pedido alguna cosa de su cuerpo, y ella le había ofrecido una uña de un dedo del medio de la mano derecha, y que por regocijo del concierto, habían bailado con el dicho cabrón y él se había echado carnalmente con todas tres en presencia de todas y que aquella noche la dicha olaya la había untado las coyunturas de los dedos de pies y manos 
y en compañía del dicho cabrón habían ido a una casa y llevando unas brosas en una teja habían entrado por una ventana a las doce de la noche y echando sueño a los padres con unas dormideras y otras hierbas puestas debajo de la almohada les habían sacado una niña de la cama y apretándola por las arcas la habían ahogado y encendido lumbre con lo que llevaban y la quemaron las partes traseras y quebrantado los brazos y que al ruido habían despertado los dichos padres y ellas se habían vuelto con el dicho cabrón por el aire a casa de la dicha olalla a donde se habían vestido y ido cada una a su casa y que la ida y vuelta iban por el aire desnudas y diciendo de viga con la ira de santa maría y que de allí a pocos días el dicho cabrón había ido una noche a casa de la dicha mateo y hallándola acostada la había forzado y tenido cuenta carnal con ella diciendo en esto algunas particularidades y lo mesmo había tenido otras diez o doce noches y en los dichos cuatro años otras veces a menudo y lo mesmo había hecho en las cárceles del dicho vicario y que a cabo de algunos pocos días en casa de la dicha olalla le había dado un cuchillo y con él se había cortado la uña que le había mandado y se la había entregado y otras noches untándose en casa de la dicha olalla y en compañía de lo dicho cabrón habían ido a otra casa y ahogado un niño y arrancándole sus vergüenzas y después a otras dos casas en diferentes noches y ahogado otras dos criaturas y que una sola vez había invocado al demonio diciéndole demonio ven a mi llamado y mandado y pasadas las horas del derecho se ratificó en la dicha confesión y el dicho vicario hizo acareación de la dicha catalina mateo con la dicha olalla y en su presencia la dicha mateo le dijo todo lo arriba dicho afirmándose en ello y la otra negándolo y en este estado remitió a la dicha mateo a este santísimo oficio al cual habiendo sido traída presa en la primera audiencia que con ella se tuvo dijo que pedía misericordia del grave pecado que había hecho en levantarse así y las dichas olalla y izquierda lo que de ellas había dicho y de sí confesado ante el dicho vicario lo cual había dicho por miedo del tormento y habiéndose examinados dieciséis testigos en el cázar constó ser verdad que los dichos niños habían sido muertos y se hallaron de la misma manera y forma muertos y maltratados que la sobredicha mateo lo había confesado y habiéndose substanciado su proceso fue puesta a cuestión de tormento y habiéndose pronunciado la sentencia y abajádola a la cámara para ejecutarse antes de desnudarse habiendo sido amonestada dijo ser verdad todo lo que había dicho ante el vicario de alcalá y en efecto lo refirió en substancia aunque en algunas circunstancias mudó alguna cosa asegurando mucho ser verdad ansí en la manera del confesar como del jurarlo y pasadas las horas del derecho se ratificó en sus confesiones y en otras audiencias que con ella se tuvieron después dijo lo mismo negando saber de que fuesen hechos los dichos ingüentos ni haber tenido otro pacto tácito ni expreso con el demonio más de que había dicho y dijo las causas que había tenido de vengarse de los padres en la muerte de sus hijos que son las mesmas que los padres testificaron por donde sospechaban que ellas se los hubiesen muerto y substencióse su causa 
y botóse auto con corosa, levi, doscientos azotes y reclusa por el tiempo que pareciere. Appendix third. Letter of the Suprema on the Tumult of May 2nd, 1808. Archivo Histórico Nacional. Inquisición de Valencia. Cartas del Consejo. Legajo 17, número 3, folio 31. C. Page 401. Las fatales resultas que se han experimentado en esta corte el día 2 del corriente por el alboroto escandaloso del bajo pueblo contra las tropas del emperador de los franceses hacen necesaria la vigilancia más activa y esmerada de todas las autoridades y cuerpos respetables de la nación para evitar que se repitan iguales excesos y mantener en todos los pueblos la tranquilidad y sosiego que exige su propio interés no menos que la hospitalidad y atención debida a los oficiales y soldados de una nación amiga que a ninguno ofenden y han dado hasta ahora las mayores pruebas de buen orden y disciplina castigando con rigor a los que se propasan o maltratan a los españoles en su persona o bienes es bien presumible que la malevolencia o la ignorancia hayan seducido a los incautos y sencillos para empeñarles en el desorden revolucionario so color de patriotismo y amor al soberano y corresponde por lo mismo a la ilustración y celo de los entendidos el desimpresionarles de un error tan perjudicial haciéndoles conocer que semejantes movimientos tumultuarios lejos de producir los efectos propios del amor y lealtad bien dirigidos sólo sirven para poner la patria en convulsión rompiendo los vínculos de subordinación en que está afianzada la salud de los pueblos apagando los sentimientos de humanidad y destruyendo la confianza que se debe tener en el gobierno que es el único a quien toca dirigir y dar impulso con uniformidad y con provecho al valor y a los esfuerzos del patriotismo estas verdades de tanta importancia ninguno puede persuadirlas mejor que los ministros de la religión de jesucristo que toda respira paz y fraternidad entre los hombres igualmente que su misión respeto y obediencia a las autoridades y como los individuos y dependientes del santo oficio deban ser y han sido siempre los primeros en dar ejemplo de ministros de paz y que procuran la paz hemos creído señores conveniente y muy propio de la obligación de nuestro ministerio el dirigiros la presente carta para que enterados de su contexto y penetrados de la urgente necesidad de concurrir unánimemente a la conservación de la tranquilidad pública la hagáis entender a los subalternos de ese tribunal y a los comisarios y familiares del distrito a fin de que todos y cada uno contribuir sic por su parte con cuanto celo actividad y prudencia les fuere posible a tan interesante objeto tendréislo entendido y del recibo de ésta daréis el correspondiente aviso dios os guarde madrid 6 de mayo de 1808. doctor don gab nevia y noriega don raimundo eltenhardt y salinas fray man de san josé rubricado recibida en nueve de mayo de mil ochocientos ocho su santidad bertrán lazo acedo encina ejecútese como su altísima lo manda rúbrica valencia certifico el infrascrito secretario del secreto del santo oficio de la inquisición de valencia que en el día once del mes de mayo del año mil ochocientos y ocho estando en su audiencia de la mañana 
los señores inquisidores, doctor don Matías Bertrán, licenciado don Nicolás Rodríguez Lazo, doctor don Pablo Acedo Rico y doctor don Franco de la Encina, entraron en ella los ministros, calificadores, titulados, notarios y familiares que viven en esta ciudad, a los cuales, precedida con vocación para este fin, se les leyó esta carta de los señores del Consejo de Su Majestad de la Santa y General Inquisición, y en seguida se les exhortó por el señor inquisidor decano a su más exacto cumplimiento. Y para que lo susodicho conste, doy la presente certificación que firmo en la Cámara del Secreto de la Inquisición de Valencia en el día once del mes de mayo de 1808. Don Man Fuster y Bertrán, secretario, rubricado. End of section number 98. Section number 99 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victor Villarraza. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by Henry Charles Lear. Appendix 4. Decree of Fernando VII, September 9, 1814. Restoring the property of the Inquisition. Archivo de Simancas, Inquisición. Libro 559. See page 427. Excelentísimo Señor, por real decreto de 21 de julio último, se sirvió su majestad mandar restablecer en todos sus dominios el santo oficio de la Inquisición al pie y estado en que se hallaba el año de 1808, y que para la subsistencia y decoro de los ministros y demás empleados de sus tribunales se restituyesen toda clase de bienes y efectos pertenecientes a su dotación, como son frutos, créditos, réditos de censos, vales y caudales que se hayan impuestos en la caja de consolidación, así como de los rendimientos de las canongias perpetuamente anejas al santo oficio, afectas por breves apostólicos. Comunicado este real decreto al Supremo Consejo de Inquisición, para su observancia, consulto a su majestad lo que en su razón tuvo por conveniente al cabal cumplimiento de las piadosas reales intenciones, manifestando al propio tiempo los ruinosos y destruidos que se hallaban los edificios destinados al tribunal del santo oficio, extravío de sus papeles más interesantes, ya de causas de fe, ya de la hacienda del real fisco que fueron presa de los ejecutores de los decretos de abolición de los tribunales de inquisición enterado su majestad de todo y deseoso de llevar a debido efecto su citado real decreto de veintiuno de julio ha resuelto se pongan desde luego sin demora ni detención alguna a disposición de los tesoreros de los respectivos tribunales de inquisición todas las fincas y efectos de cualquiera clase que sean pertinecientes al tribunal y que en este concepto hayan sido secuestrados, confiscados, detenidos o aplicados a lo que se llama Hacienda Pública o Nacional, devolviendo todos los títulos de propiedad y legitimación de créditos que hubiesen recibido y cortando la cuenta el día 21 de julio del presente año, den razón de las personas obligadas al pago de sus arrendamientos y obligaciones con expresión de sus cantidades y procedencias. 
de orden del rey lo comunico a vuestra excelencia para su inteligencia y puntual cumplimiento y a fin de que esta real resolución la haga circular a los gobernadores intendentes directores del crédito público o sujetos encargados de la real recaudación de intereses en los pueblos de sus distritos dios guarde a vuestra excelencia muchos años madrid 3 de septiembre de 1814 señor virrey y capitán general de etc appendix v decree of suppression march 9 1820 miraflores documentos a los que se hace referencia en los apuntes histórico críticos 1 93 rodrigo historia verdadera 3 494 see page 436 considerando que es incompatible la existencia del tribunal de la inquisición con la constitución de la monarquía española promulgada en Cádiz en 1812, y que por esta razón lo suprimieron las Cortes Generales y Extraordinarias por decreto de 22 de febrero de 1813, previa a una madura y larga discusión, oída la opinión de la Junta formada por decreto de este día y conformándome con su parecer, He venido en mandar que desde hoy quede suprimido el referido tribunal en toda la monarquía y por consecuencia el Consejo de la Suprema Inquisición, poniéndose inmediatamente en libertad a todos los presos que estén en sus cárceles por opiniones políticas o religiosas, pasándose a los reverendos obispos las causas de estos últimos en sus respectivas diócesis para que las sustancien y determinen con arreglo en todo al expresado decreto de las cortes extraordinarias tendréislo entendido y dispondréis lo conveniente a su cumplimiento palacio nueve de marzo de mil ochocientos veinte está rubricado al secretario de gracia y justicia Appendix VI The Last Vote of the Supreme Council February 10, 1820 Libro de votos secretos Archivo de Simancas Inquisición Libro 890 See page 437 Toledo Don Manuel de la Peña Palacios En el Consejo A 10 de febrero de 1820 Señores Evia, Ettenhard, Amarilla, Galarza, Martínez, Veramendi, Prado. Hagan justicia como lo tienen acordado. Voto del tribunal. En el santo oficio de Toledo, en veintinueve días del mes de enero de 1820, estando en la audiencia de su mañana el señor inquisidor, doctor don José Francisco Bordujo y Rivas, que asiste solo, habiendo visto esta causa contra don Manuel de la Peña Palacios, presbítero cura que fue del lugar de Ontoba y actualmente de Torrejón del Rey en este arzobispado, por delitos de proposiciones y propagar doctrinas peligrosas contrarias al sentir de la Iglesia, dijo que su voto y parecer es que a este reo, a puerta cerrada, en la sala de audiencia y a presencia del secretario de la causa, se le reprenda, amoneste y conmine por las proposiciones propaladas ya en sus sermones, ya en sus conversaciones familiares. Se le absuelva ad cautelam y por quince días se le ejercite espiritualmente en el convento de padres carmelitas descalzos de esta ciudad al cargo de director que se le señale se le advierta que por ahora le trata el tribunal con toda conmiseración y clemencia por habérselo implorado en las audiencias que con él se han tenido y por esperar su total enmienda en el modo irregular con que hasta aquí se ha conducido con sus feligreses 
y se estará a la mira de su conducta y operaciones y antes de ejecutarse se remita a su altísima con todos los expedientes que han precedido para su aprobación y lo rubricó de que certifico está rubricado don domingo sánchez fijón secretario End of section number 99Section number 100 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by henry charles lear appendix seven dictamen of the consejo de gobierno on the decree extinguishing the inquisition archivo de alcalá ministerio de estado legajo 906 n 88 see page 467 Señor Secretario de Estado y del Despacho de Gracia y Justicia, Excelentísimo Señor, he recibido el oficio de Vuestra Excelencia de nueve del presente con el proyecto de decreto en que se declara suprimido el Tribunal de la Inquisición. Se adjudican sus bienes y rentas a la extinción de la deuda pública y se fija la suerte de los dependientes del Tribunal, cuyo proyecto remite vuestra excelencia de real orden al consejo porque lo examine y exponga su dictamen. Enterado de todo y después de una detenida discusión, ha acordado el consejo manifieste a vuestra excelencia que reconoce la conveniencia de coadyuvar al sostenimiento del crédito del Estado por cuantos medios estén al alcance del gobierno y reconoce asimismo sí que los bienes de la Inquisición, suprimida a lo menos de hecho por el rey difunto que nunca permitió que restableciese, podrán proporcionar algún auxilio a la caja de amortización sin agravio de nadie, pues en el proyecto de decreto se establece el conveniente para asegurar a los empleados del tribunal las asignaciones que les correspondan según sus circunstancias y clasificaciones. Por estas consideraciones, no haya reparo el Consejo en que su majestad apruebe en lo sustancial el proyecto de decreto, aunque en su dictamen podrían hacerse en él las siguientes modificaciones. Primera, en la parte del preámbulo, donde hablando de la autoridad pontificia se usa de la expresión primado de la iglesia universal cree el consejo que podría seguirse el uso constante de designar dicha autoridad pontificia con el nombre de santa sede o sumo pontífice no porque el consejo desconozca la propiedad del título de primado de la iglesia universal con arreglo a los sacros cánones, sino porque en materia de denominaciones y fórmulas es siempre preferible el uso de las establecidas y más comunes que innovarlas, porque puede darse lugar a que se crea que la innovación envuelva algún designio que la malignidad interpreta según su antojo. Segunda, cuando en el artículo primero se dice que se declara suprimido el tribuno de la Inquisición, podrá darse motivo a que se infiera por esta expresión que el gobierno lo había creído subsistente hasta el día de derecho, cuya idea no aparece enteramente exacta, pues el señor don Fernando VII, resistiendo siempre a las gestiones de algunas corporaciones para su restablecimiento, y habiendo restituido a los arzobispos y obispos el conocimiento sobre las causas de fe que les corresponde por derecho común, 
dio bastante a entender que su real ánimo estaba decidido a la extinción de la Inquisición, aunque, por ciertas consideraciones, no la hubiere pronunciado más explícitamente. Cree, pues, el consejo preferible que en dicho artículo se haga alguna mención de lo hecho por el difunto rey sobre esta materia, a que aparezca dicha extinción como un acto de la regencia en su totalidad. Y si no juzga su majestad que haya necesidad de ello, por lo menos el consejo cree que al expresado artículo convendrá añadir la palabra definitivamente, para que diga se declara suprimido definitivamente el tribunal de la Inquisición. Tercero, el consejo entiende que en la actualidad convendría suprimir enteramente el artículo cuarto por el que se autoriza al señor secretario del despacho de Hacienda para la pronta enajenación de las fincas, pues, habiéndose vendido muchas de ellas en tiempo del gobierno constitucional, y no siendo posible todavía hacer distinción alguna entre las que se enajenaron y las que no se enajenaron en dicha época, hasta que las Cortes examinen la grave cuestión relativa a los compradores de bienes nacionales, podría darse motivo a que se sospechase que se decidía este punto general por el presente decreto de una manera indirecta, mandando vender todos los bienes de la Inquisición indistintamente y sin hacer diferencia alguna entre los enajenados y los no enajenados. Parece, pues, que por ahora conviene limitarse a lo que se previene en el artículo segundo aplicando la masa de los bienes de la Inquisición a la extinción de la deuda pública sin más explicación. Cuarto, el artículo sexto, en que se ordena que los sueldos de los empleados del tribunal se paguen del tesoro público, cree el Consejo que podría modificarse mandando que este pago se hiciese por la caja de amortización, pues no parece justo imponer este nuevo gravamen al real tesoro, cuando nada es más natural que satisfacer el gravamen vitalicio que pesa sobre los bienes y rentas del tribunal por el mismo establecimiento a donde han a ingresar sus productos. Esto no ofrecerá inconveniente aún después que se vendan todas las fincas que pertenecían a la Inquisición, pues siempre quedarán las ciento y una canonjas de que habla el artículo tercero del proyecto que no son susceptibles de enajenación y con cuyo producto habrá más que lo suficiente para pagar a los cesantes del ramo cuyo número se hallará muy reducido por los que han fallecido o pasado a otros destinos desde el año de 1823 hasta el día, y se reducirá todavía más por las disposiciones de los artículos quinto y sexto del mismo proyecto de decreto. Lo que por acuerdo del Consejo digo a vuestra excelencia en contestación a su citado oficio con devolución del proyecto. Dios etcétera, Madrid, 13 de julio de 1834, el Conde de Ofalia. Appendix 8. Decree of July 15, 1834. Abolishing the Inquisition. Print by Castillo y Allenza. Negociaciones con Roma, Madrid, 1859. Tomo 1. Apéndice, página 165. See page 468. Deseando aumentar el crédito público de la nación por todos los medios compatibles con los principios de justicia, teniendo en consideración que mi augusto esposo, que está en gloria, creyó bastante eficaz al sostenimiento de la religión del Estado la nativa e imprescriptible autoridad de los muy reales arzobispos y reales obispos, 
protegida cual corresponde por las leyes de la monarquía, que mi real decreto de cuatro de enero próximo pasado ha dejado en manos de dichos prelados la censura de los escritos concernientes a la fe, a la moral y disciplina, para que se conserve ileso tan precioso depósito, que están ya concluidos los trabajos del código criminal en que se establecen las convenientes penas contra los que intenten vulnerar el respeto debido a nuestra santa religión y que la junta eclesiástica creada por mi real decreto de veintidós de abril se ocupa de proponer cuanto juzgue conducente a tan importante fin para que provea yo de remedio hasta donde alcance el real patronato y con la concurrencia de la santa sede en cuanto menester fuere en nombre de mi excelsa hija doña isabel segunda oído el consejo de gobierno y el de ministros he venido en mandar lo siguiente artículo primero se declara suprimido definitivamente el tribunal de la inquisición segundo los predios rústicos y urbanos censos u otros bienes con que le había dotado la piedad soberana o cuya adquisición le proporcionó por medio de leyes dictadas para su protección se adjudican a la extinción de la deuda pública tercero las ciento una canongias que estaban agregadas a la inquisición se aplican al mismo objeto con sujeción a mi real decreto de nueve de marzo último y por el tiempo que expresan las bulas apostólicas sobre la materia cuarto los empleados de dicho tribunal y sus dependencias que posean prebendas eclesiásticas u obtengan cargos civiles de cualquier clase con sueldo no tendrán derecho a percibir el que les correspondía sobre los fondos del mismo tribunal cuando servían en él sus destinos quinto todos los demás empleados mientras no se les proporcione otra colocación percibirán exactamente de la caja de amortización el sueldo que les corresponda según clasificación que solicitarán ante la junta creada al efecto tendréis lo entendido y dispondréis lo necesario a su cumplimiento en san ildefonso a quince de julio de mil ochocientos treinta y cuatro a don nicolás maría garelli End of section one hundred. Recording by Victor Villarraza. End of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lear.